Judge Dredd. The Novelization by Neil Barrett Jr. The shuttle had gotten its cleansing spray. Nearly faded letters on the side read, Mega City Judge System, Aspen Prison Shuttle Number 3. Next, the guard said. He stuck his right hand into the blinking red slot. The robot sensor whirred, then winked at him in green. Ferguson, Herman, ASP, Niner 00764, sentence served, six months, three days. Welcome back, citizen. Thanks, Fergie said. The robot made a bleeding sound and then flipped him a blue plastic card. The card showed Fergie's face the day he'd entered prison. He was free. He didn't feel free, but he'd be damned if he'd let that hold him back. The back of the card read, Living Assignment, Red Quad, Block Y, Heavenly Haven, Citizen Suite 666. Poking his card in an info slot led him to the Skycap station that would take him to the Red Quad sector some 60 miles away. The Skycap set him down on a pleasant street. Couples strolled hand in hand. Children chased each other across the lush lawn. The scene brought a smile to Fergie's face. Man, can these frigs possibly be as dumb as they look? These groons mooning in the park would buy a sack full of spiders if they thought they could get them half price. Wonderful, Fergie said aloud. Herman Ferguson loves Heavenly Haven. Herman Ferguson is going to fit right in. Coming soon, citizens, the Heavenly Haven Pocket Park, bringing fresh air and recreation to your lives. Another design for better living from the Mega City Council. Fergie blinked startled by the sonorous voice that seemed to come from everywhere, a voice you knew you could trust. Coming soon, citizens, the Heavenly Haven Pocket Park, bringing fresh air and... Heavenly Haven Pocket Park suddenly disappeared. Fergie stared at the dirty graffiti-covered wall and felt the color rise to his face. Six months in Aspen and he'd let himself be conned by a damn holo poster. Everyone was running south. Fergie followed a comfortable distance behind the crowd. They were throwing rocks and bottles at the wall where the holo of Heavenly Haven Pocket Park had been. The holo was different now. It showed a great shining building stretching to the skies. The golden shield and eagle of the judges was superimposed on the image, glowing in the painted blue sky. He could hear the booming voice. Coming soon, the Heavenly Haven Law Enforcement Barracks bringing surveillance and security to your lives. Another design for better living from the Mega City Council. Coming soon, the heavenly... A woman beat at the image with the leg of a chair. They stole our park. Damn them all, lying bastards. Stinking lying judges. The crowd swept forward in a wave. And that was the moment the weapons opened up on the crowded streets below. Men and women screamed. Lead ripped flesh and bone. Heads exploded and limbs tore away. A river of blood spattered the dark and grimy walls. And Herman Ferguson, ASP Niner 00764, peed in his prison issue trousers and ran like hell. Fergie headed up the stairs. He glanced once more at the address on his card Red Quad, Block Y. Heavenly Haven, Suite 666. He stepped on something that squealed. Something darted up the sooty wall. Fergie gasped for breath as he passed the second floor. He rested on four, took it easy up to five, and ran up to six. The hall was empty except for trash. A battered food cart rounded the corner. Delicious and healthful ration packs, piping hot and ready to eat. Delicious and healthful ration packs. Piping hot and... Number 666 was a door smeared with the usual unintelligible graffiti. But he felt a great sense of relief. He hadn't actually been alone for six months. No space, no privacy. 
just a couple of thousand mean, hairy sons of bitches who'd kick you to death for entertainment or slide a rusty shiv into your heart. He turned the knob and stepped inside. A man with purple ears jammed a pistol up Fergie's nose. You a judge, spy, little man? There were two other men in the room. They stood by an open window. They gripped enormous weapons in their hands. Now Fergie could hear the crowd below. Weapons, window, crowd. Fergie felt the hair creep up his neck. All the slaughter down there was coming from here, in 666, in his room, which he didn't really want anymore. All right, Fergie said. Well, what it is, I, I, I got the wrong room. Hell, I probably got the wrong building. So I'll just run along. I'll leave you guys to your... You hold it, Droog. Purple Ears stepped in his path. You don't bees going anywhere, okay? You hear him down there? It's a block war, man. Purple Ears' companion cheered. One had two rows of shiny hypo needle teeth. The other wore a metal jacket he'd made from tin cans. A dead mouse hung from the lobe of each ear. Yeah, said Needle Teeth. If you live here, if you're a resi, <laughs> you're gonna stand up for your block. Metal Jacket grinned. You don't look like no spy to me. Let's go, Haven. Heavenly Haven all the way. Needle Teeth loosed a burst of automatic fire into the crowd down below. Purple Ears snapped off a dozen rounds with his automatic pistol. Block war, block war. Pour it on him, droogs. Metal Jacket joined in. The noise of his black and copper weapon ripped through Fergie's head. Damn it, you gotta stop this, Fergie cried out. I'm on parole. They catch me with you morons, my ass is back in Aspen again. Fergie knew he had to do something. People were getting slaughtered down there. And though he didn't really know his neighbors that well, blowing them all to hell was the wrong thing to do. Especially if the judges blamed him for having a bunch of crazies in his room. Fergie threw himself at Purple Ears and grabbed for his gun. Purple Ears whipped the butt of his pistol around and whacked Fergie firmly on the jaw. It was close to sunset outside but it was always high noon in the harshly lit corridors of Mega City's Hall of Justice. There were secrets in this building only a handful of people ever knew. It was exactly 1847 hours when Judge Hershey left locker room G and walked down the narrow rampway to level 17, her black helmet tucked beneath her arm. Her black hair was cut nearly as short as a man's. A curl formed a perfect half moon on either cheek her only concession to fashion and her sex. Not that anyone had ever mistaken her for a man. Though her, she was dressed in the standard beetle black armor, gauntlets and boots of a judge, no one with normal vision would make a mistake like that. She was trained, disciplined, and quick as death, or she would have never earned the eagle and shield badge molded in copper and chrome across her breast. Armor glass doors slid aside and Hershey walked into the vast curved tunnel that was the heart of the street judge's life. The thunder of engines was a living force that rose up through Hershey's boots, rippled through her belly, spread like a tremor of the earth into her arms and legs. She was certain hers was a feeling shared by any man or woman who had ever walked into level 17 among a hundred gleaming lawmasters crouched and waiting to come alive. These squat black monsters lightning-fast killing machines and a hundred generations removed from their ancestors of the world of way back when, and nearly as deadly as the peace officers who rode them through the streets of Mega City now. Hershey spotted rookie Briscoe. It was 1852 hours, eight minutes until the shift changed at 1900, and the tunnel was filled with armor-clad judges and red sleeve maintenance personnel. Uh, judge, ma'am? Hershey stopped abruptly and wheeled around. Oh, Meyer. If you've read Manners and Conventions, Article 7, you will be aware of the fact that there is no such thing as ma'am. Ma'am is the gender title, cadet. All judges are addressed as judge. They are not, I repeat, not addressed as sir, ma'am, miss, it, or any other discriminatory word or phrase. 
Do you read me, cadet? Yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, yes, judge. Olmeyer backed off. His throat went suddenly dry. It always happened when he spoke to Judge Hershey. He couldn't look her straight in the eye. If he did, she took his breath away and scared him to death at the same time. Briscoe was standing by his lawmaster. Anything Judge Hershey did, thought, or said was fine with him. He had dreams about Hershey he wouldn't even tell his best friend Miguel. It frightened him to think about things like that. If he ever had to do a truth session, he'd take the kill pill before he'd let him know what was churning through his head. Nice evening, Judge, he said. I hope that little droog didn't bother you any. Cadets are sure a pain in the... Shut up, Briscoe. A cadet is lower than a slug's belly, and a rookie is a quarter inch higher than that. You read me clear? Yes, Judge. Good. Excellent, Briscoe. Now get your act together. The citizens aren't paying you to look nice in your new black suit. Straddle that mother and find me some crime. Hershey leaned into the wind, taking the skyway curve at a non-regulation 22 degrees. Easy, Briscoe, she said into her comm. There's no one on the way yet but us. She keyed the map of her dash. Red quad. Left, then a minute and a half. You take the street left, I'll take it right. And Briscoe, watch yourself, okay? Hey, don't worry about me. Action is my middle. Whoa! Yellow tracers stitched the street. Take cover, Hershey shouted. Combat one. She threw the machine into a skid, drew her lawgiver, and loosed a stream of fire into the tenement above. His voice said he still had the stupid rookie grin on his face. What do you want me to do, he said. What are your orders, Judge? Hershey dug a burst of fire slammed into her machine. Briscoe, this is real. We will stand down and wait for backup. A hail of fire sent him real. When the acrid smoke cleared, a concrete gully a foot deep snaked across the street from one curb to the next. The line ran an inch from Briscoe's knee. That is mucking heavy arms. These guys aren't kidding. What did you expect? Hershey said. Spitballs? Calm Delta, Calm Delta, this is Jaybird Fiver, in position outside Heavenly Haven, Red Quad. Under fire, I repeat, we are under fire. Request backup. Nearest judge, nearest... A fireball suddenly erupted behind her. Flames licked the side of the building and glass exploded from the windows. Request backup now, damn it! Hershey shouted into her comm. Now, or forget it! Hershey's lawmaster lifted into the air. Hershey screamed as the blast sent her rolling helplessly head over heels along the street. From the corner of her eye, she could see the big machine against the sky. The lawmaster seemed to float forever like a black steel balloon. Crisco scooped her up in his arms as Hershey's lawmaster struck the ground like a bomb. He leaped for the cover of his machine, gunfire chewing up the street at his boots. The lawmaster exploded into a burst of white flame sprawled on the ground and covered Hershey's head. He opened her visor and saw blood coming from her nose. Judge, you, you all right? No, Briscoe, I am not all right. Now get off of me. Judge, Briscoe's eyes went wide. What if she thought that he... Oh, God, she couldn't think that. These machines are supposed to serve as a protective barrier under any adverse circumstances a judge might encounter in the line of duty, Hershey said. I repeat, any adverse circumstances. I guess they don't, Briscoe said. If you can't depend on your equipment, you're in deep shit, rookie. Tracer bullets rained down on the street. Lead beat a steady tattoo into the armor of Briscoe's machine. If we don't get out of here, we'll die. Our backup isn't coming, Judge. Our backup is somewhere else, caught in another street fight. You are wrong, Briscoe. Article 19 says a judge in pursuit of his or her duty is never abandoned. When a judge requires aid, aid will be rendered in sufficient force to remedy the situation in question. Have you read the articles, rookie? Hershey jerked around as a deep roll of thunder exploded and a black lawmaster burst through the curtain of flame. 
the rider slammed a heavy boot on the brakes, spinning his machine in a circle, blasting the scent of rubber into the smoky air. Gunfire ringed the man in a cage of hot steel. Briscoe stared. Who the... who the hell's that? He's a sitting duck out there. Flames licked at the dark figure's heels. He stalked through the fire, ignoring the chatter of weapons from overhead. Lifting the speaker mic from his lawmaster, he turned and let his visored gaze sweep the tall buildings on every side. Drop your weapons, everybody. This block is under arrest. Holy crud! Briscoe raised up and blinked. It's him. It's Dread. High-pitched laughter rang from the tenement above. You want us? Come and get us, Dreddy. Gunfire dug up chunks of pavement at Judge Dredd's feet. Judge Dredd, take cover, Briscoe shouted. Dredd ignored him. He walked over and looked down at Briscoe, then at Hershey. Backup's here. He slapped the side of his lawgiver. Let's go. Keep it simple. Standard relay, single file, on point. Dredd turned away. He looked at his weapon and spoke. Grenade! The door exploded and slammed against the far wall. Dredd stepped inside. Upstairs, the perpetrator's fire comes from six. It was nearly pitch dark and he didn't use a light. Kept up a hard and steady pace and didn't stop until they reached six. Hershey was grateful she hadn't slacked off on her Azjex routine, the advanced street judge exercise program. Briscoe was breathing hard behind her. At 666, Dredd stopped and raised his hand, motioned Hershey to the left and Briscoe to the right. Lawful entry, Dredd said aloud. Suspicion of felons with illegal weapons inside. He drew back a lever on his lawgiver and blew the door apart. Metal jacket and needle teeth turned from the window and stared. D -d -d Dredd! Metal Jacket went white and swept his automatic weapon toward the door. Armed. Resisting arrest. The lawgiver jerked in Dredd's hands. Metal Jacket and needle teeth splattered against the wall and exploded into flames. Smoking flesh slid to the floor. This room is pacified, said Dredd. Hershey saw the figure appear in the doorway. Purple ears grinned, raised his pistol in a blur, shot Briscoe in the head. Hershey turned on the man, but Judge Dredd was already there. He swept the lawgiver into an arc and rammed the butt hard in Purple Ears' gut. Purple Ears dropped his weapon. Dredd hit him again on the jaw. Hershey went to Briscoe at once. She raised his visor, saw what was there, shut her eyes. Dredd stepped over to the man on the floor and poked him with his boot. You have obscenities written all over your head. Are you aware that's a violation of the law? Purple Ears spat a mouthful of blood on the floor and laughed. Hey, are, are you kidding me or what? You gonna arrest me or something? Then do it, man. Mega Cities Municipal Code 334-8, Dredge said. Willful destruction of property. Two years. Listen, pal. Code 11-5-er. Illegal possession of weapons. Five years. Code 34-A. Resisting arrest. Twenty years. All right, all right. Purple Ears raised his hands. I gives up. You be taking me in? Niner 804. Assault on a judge with a deadly weapon. Purple Ears forced a weak grin through bloody teeth. Don't tell me. Life, right? No, Dredd said. Death. He squeezed the trigger of his weapon, squeezed it, and didn't stop. Purple ears began to sizzle like bacon in a pan. Hershey swallowed hard, but she wouldn't look away. A street judge didn't betray her feelings. She didn't throw up. She maintained her cool at all times. Dread released the trigger. Court is adjourned, he said. Black-clad judges, medics, and techies crowded the sixth-floor hallway of Heavenly Haven. Briscoe's body was the first one into the hall. The medics had scraped the remains of the three lawbreakers into one plastic bag, but Briscoe was one of their own. As the stretcher passed Hershey, she said, He was a rookie. He was my rookie. I was supposed to watch out for him, damn it. Judge Dredd shook his head. 
Don't blame yourself. He made a mistake, not you. His reactions were slow, judgment faulty. Hershey turned on him and glared. My God, Dredd. Is that all you have to say? He got his face blown off his first week on the job. He beat the odds then. Mort's stats say 5.7 days. Dredd stopped. The battered food cart was rolling toward them, wobbling drunkenly on its broken wheel. Um, um, yum. Healthful and nutritious ration packs ready to eat. Dredd stepped into the robot's path, gripped his lawgiver in both hands, and aimed it at the robot's shiny dome. Halt. You have ten seconds to surrender. Ten. Nine. Dredd, take it easy, Hershey said. It's a servo droid. Make your selection, please. Insert your card in the slot. Dredd took one step forward and shoved the barrel of his weapon half a foot into the slot. Make your select... Ah, oh, shit! The front of the robot came totally unhinged. Boxy food packs and drab shades of gray, brown, and mildew green spilled onto the floor. Half a second later, Fergie tumbled out of the back. He blinked in the unfamiliar light, staring at Hershey and Dredd like an animal caught in the woods. Dredd grabbed Fergie by the collar and slammed him hard against the wall. Mega City Municipal Code 1 Deuce Niner 6. Willful sabotage of a public droid. That's six months, citizen. Let's see your card. Come on, give me a break, Judge. Fergie stared at the eagle and shield an inch before his eyes. Judge Dredd? Oh, my God. Snapping a scanner off of her weapons belt, Hershey flipped Fergie's card through the narrow slot once. A hollow cube blossomed into life. Magenta words crawled across its face. Ferguson, Herman D., Mega City 2, L.A., Sentence, Aspen Prison, Time Served, 6 Months, 3 Days, Charges, Tampering of City Droids, Computers, Cash Machines, Robo Taxis, Released, Mega City 1, Sentence completed. Dredd shook his head in disgust. You got off the shuttle this afternoon. You haven't been out of jail five hours, Ferguson. He turned to Hershey. He's a habitual. Automatic five-year sentence. Fergie turned white. Five years? No way. Look, I didn't have a choice. These droogs were in my room. They, they hit me on the head. What was I supposed to do? Jump out the damn window? It's legal. Dredd said. It's suicide, Fergie shouted. It's six floors down. Case closed. Five years. I've got a question, Hershey said. How do you work that food droid? That's a highly complex electronic device. Only a trained, skilled professional could possibly do that. Yeah? You kidding? Fergie grinned. What you do is you cross the yellow wire with the blue wire... Unless you got a Model E, and then you got a... Hey! Dredd let go, and Fergie dropped to the ground. You've just made a confession, citizen. Duly dated and recorded. He nodded at the street judge standing in the hall. Take this person away. Next shuttle back to Aspen Prison. Downstairs, Hershey stood in the night and looked out over the ruined neighborhood. There were 50 million people in Mega City 1. Fifty million packed into 320 square miles. A hundred and twenty years before, a city with another name had stood there. That city had held eight million people in the same 320 square miles. Crime had nearly overwhelmed the city then, and there had been no judges to keep the vast and lawless population under control. If we ever lost the upper hand here... Hershey shuddered at the thought. Maybe she was wrong and Dredd was right. Maybe they couldn't afford to understand. Maybe there was no way to let their guard down. Article 1 carved on the high wall at the entry to the Hall of Justice read, First, there is the law. It was something Dredd understood, that there was no other way, no other means to assure that civilization survived. She walked out into the street and studied the burned and twisted mass of metal that had been her lawmaster half an hour before. I'd better start thinking how I'm going to write this sucker up. Better be one hell of a report, she said aloud. Some jerko at the hall is a real bad day. I'll be buying this wreck for the rest of my natural life. The room was small. 
There were three comfortable chairs, an antique glass table, and a video screen mounted on the wall. The room was just off the hallway leading to the chamber of the Council of Judges. The session that was about to begin was closed to all but the council members themselves, an emergency session of the gravest order. There was only one topic of note in Mega City at the moment. The only subject covered on the video news, terror was loose in the streets, and the city was caught in a web of fear. This is Vardis Hammond, and I'm standing in front of the ruins of Heavenly Haven Block. Fifty-three citizens have been hospitalized, five of them children. The death count is 19 so far, and many victims are still on the critical list. The perpetrators themselves are among the dead. They have tentatively been identified as crazed squatters who were allegedly killed in summary execution by Judge Dredd himself. Now, the number of squatters involved has yet to be determined due to the difficulty in separating the individual bodies. Dredd turned as the door to the hallway slid aside. He came to attention and nodded his head in respect as Chief Justice Fargo walked into the room. Joseph, Joseph, no formalities, please. <laughs> you make me feel like an old man, which is precisely what I am, by the way. If we had a hundred men like you, sir, we could clean up Mega City by morning. Fargo shook his head. Well, I'd call that blatant flattery if it came from any other man. Now tell me, Joseph. The summary executions at Heavenly Haven, were they, uh, absolutely necessary? Unavoidable, sir. Unavoidable. Hmm. Well, we make our own reality, don't we, Joseph? The severity of those executions, were they unavoidable, too? Dredd felt the color rise to his face. With all due respect, sir, a rookie judge died out there today, too. Times have changed in the city. Life doesn't mean much to some people anymore. You'd be able to see that if you weren't... If I weren't what, Joseph? Always at the Academy, sir. Fargo allowed the beginning of a smile to crease his features. But don't you mean at the Academy wiping cadets' asses? <laughs> That's what they say in the squad room, isn't it? Dredd cleared his throat. That's irrelevant, sir. You set the standards, Chief Justice Fargo. No, that's not true. Fargo wet his lips. Now you do. Why, to the young cadets, you're a legend. I don't feel much like a legend, sir. We don't decide what we are. They do. Do you remember your time at the Academy, Joseph? I remember what you taught me, sir. And I remember a cadet who embraced justice. The ideals as well as the lessons. My finest student, out of all the thousands I have been privileged to congratulate as a newly appointed judge, you are the best, Judge Dredd. Thank you, sir. The compliment is undeserved, but I am grateful for your words. Oh, fine, fine. Mm. Fargo pulled himself erect. I have drawn a new assignment for you, Joseph. Starting tomorrow morning, you'll be spending two days a week at the Academy. I would be honored, sir. Armed combat or marksmanship? Fargo grinned. Ethics, Joseph. The Moral Code of Judges, Article 22. I'll drop by and see how you're doing. A massive stone eagle and shield rise up from the floor of the council chamber. A carved black table of ebony rises up before the high symbol. There are five chairs behind the table. On the high, ornate backrest of each chair is a carved replica of the eagle and shield, and below each emblem is the name of the high judge who is privileged to sit on the council. On the wall opposite the judges, a large holo flickers into life. The holo is a map of new North America. There are three pulsing blue stars on the map. Mega City 1, which rests on the 20th century foundations of New York City. Mega City 2, a massive extension of the old city of Los Angeles. And Mega City 3, Tech City, which was once called Houston. All else on this map is a dull and coppery hue. The color of the sun-baked ground. The color of the land of cursed earth. The no color of death. The members of the High Council file into the chamber and take their places. 
Judge Griffin rises slowly from his chair. He is a man of sixty years with silver hair and eyes the color of Arctic ice. My fellow judges, it is quite clear that these block wars that erupt across the city are becoming an epidemic, an epidemic that must be dealt with immediately. The measures we are taking now can only contain the sickness that threatens our society. Containment is not the answer. The only solution to our problem is a tougher criminal code, a code designed to show this filth they cannot run amuck in megacity. Judge Silver. The situation gets worse every day. Seventy-three citizen riots in two months in what? Sixteen different sectors? Judge Magruder. Violent crime is rising 15% every quarter. If we don't increase our resources, they will be inadequate in under three years. Judge Esposito. Three years? They are totally inadequate now. The council is in an uproar. A gavel strikes the table. My friends, my fellow council members, as a city we continue to grow, and growth is painful. Over 50 million people live in an area that was originally built for under 20. It's not enough that they rely on us for clothing, food, water, and clean air. Judge Griffin. Chief Justice, with all due respect, this city is in chaos. Maintaining the social order calls for tighter reins. My curfew proposal should be implemented immediately. Judge Fargo. Treat men like animals and they will act like them, sir. Judge Griffin. Perhaps you'd prefer we strip the judges of their current powers and return to the antiquated system of trial and jury? We must expand execution to include lesser crimes. Judge Fargo. This body is not the first assembly to think that more laws and fewer choices will bring peace and order. That delusion has been tried and failed before. I was hardly in my teens when I put on this badge. And when the time comes for me to take it off, let me do it knowing that it stood for freedom, not for repression. Judge Griffin. Once more, sir, you have served as a moral compass for us all. I... I wish to... Withdraw my proposal. I hope for good. Judge Fargo. Thank you, my friend. Your strength and wisdom is always an asset to this table. Now, let us all work together to continue the task we have sworn to perform, to protect and serve the citizens of Mega City. The judges file out of the room. The lights in the chamber dim. If the cursed earth is hell, then Aspen Prison is the stairway that leads to the underworld below. The warden, Judge Miller, followed the two guards down the wet and treacherous stairs, the cells descending on either side. They were not cells at all. Each was a three-foot circle in stone laced with tightly woven bars. The rooms behind these bars were seven feet square. Every other day, a jet of frigid water sluiced the prisoner's waist away. Every morning at four, Water packs and food pods were automatically dropped in each cell. The water contained a drug that would prevent a man from killing himself or escaping into any degree of madness that would let him forget about his punishment or his crime. The drugs didn't make a man feel any better. They just made him do his forever after time. Judge Miller sighed with relief when the stairs came to an end at a massive steel door. He laid his right palm on the center plate of the lock. A winking red light turned green. The door slid open without a sound, and Miller stepped inside. A pair of auto guns wheezed from the wall. Identify yourself, a metal voice said. Miller, warden judge. Voice sample recognized. Proceed, warden judge Miller. The walls of the small room were steel instead of stone. A figure stood and moved about beyond the haze. Well, Warden, back for another chat, are we? The voice was cold as glacier ice. A very short chat, Miller said. I have a good deal to do. He could never look directly into the man's eyes. We are both prisoners here, Warden Judge Miller. You behind a desk and me behind this. The good Judge Fargo's reward for our services. You killed innocent people. You went far beyond service. 
innocent. The innocent exist only until they are perpetrators themselves. You are as good an example as any, sir. You became a perpetrator when you conspired to keep me alive. When you began to accept the generous bribes to make certain I retained a healthier and more positive outlook on life than those poor devils in the pest holes out there. Miller shifted his weight. I can't stand here listening to your ravings all day. I came here because your, because our benefactor has sent a package for you. A package, is it? How delightful, I'm sure. No one sends me packages anymore. Computer, deactivate shield, Miller said. Auto guns only. The blue light flickered and faded. The auto guns in the wall whirred toward the man. Miller waited until the weapons were in place, then stepped up on the platform and handed the package to the man. The man pressed his thumb on the smooth surface. The package opened like a flower. He reached in and drew out a plastic ellipse, no longer than his thumb. Bright bands of yellow, blue, red, and green circled the object in complex geometrical patterns. I do believe it's a puzzle, the man said. He began to turn the bands of color in different directions, red on red, blue on blue. Miller cursed under his breath. I wasted my time bringing you that. Damn those people. Your time, perhaps, the man smiled. Not mine. I simply love puzzles. I remember this one. It's from India, I believe. A place that isn't there anymore. It's supposed to contain the meaning of life. The warden laughed. Good. I've got maybe a minute. Why don't you enlighten me some? Tell me, what's the meaning of life? The man gave him a weary, almost sorrowful look. It ends, he said. The puzzle made a quick, sibilant sound like the sigh of a snake. Miller felt a jolt of pain in his throat. The pain was unbearable, intense. He gasped and fell to his knees, one hand clawing at his throat. Computer, active, active, a alarm. Voice is not recognized. Repeat, your voice command is not recognized. Please remain still. D damn you! Miller choked on the words, felt the terror grip his heart. I am... Was just... Was just... just uh, Security break. Security break. Auto guns targeting. No! The guns came alive, catching Miller in a precise crossfire, cutting him in half. In the corridor outside, the two guards jacketed buck-led shells in their riot guns. One slammed the override button with his fist. They both stepped back, guns at the ready. The door slid open. The top half of Miller's body lay sprawled on the floor. The first guard gagged and stumbled back. A shadow came out of a greater shadow, twisted the guard's neck, jerked the weapon from his grasp in a blur and squeezed the trigger once. The second guard slammed against the wall. The top of his head disappeared. The man slid another shell into his gun. He reached into the open package and retrieved two items Miller hadn't been close enough to see. One was a small photograph of mega-city newscaster Vardis Hammond. The other was a pocket-sized badge embossed with a familiar eagle and shield. A name was engraved on the badge. The name read, Rico. Rico looked at the two dead guards, then dismissed them from his mind. He took three steps to Miller's body and kicked the corpse soundly in the head. Keep it to yourself, he said softly. I'm back. The following is transcribed from a partial audio tape of a lecture given by Judge Dredd at the Academy of Justice. No date is given, but from the equipment described, it would seem this event took place circa 2139. This is Lawgiver 2. 25 round sidearm with mission variable voice programmed ammunition. Pay attention. Signal flare. Yours, cadets, when you graduate. If you graduate. Now, I don't have to tell any of you what this is, but I will. Because you are cadets, 
and you don't know from nothing even if you think you do. This is the Mark IV Lawmaster, improved model. With onboard dual laser cannons, vertical takeoff and landing flight capacity, and 500 kilometer range. Note, maintenance personnel have set the machine in motion at this time. The Lawmaster rises in a hovering mode for 5.7 seconds. The drive unit fails and the Lawmaster drops heavily to the ground. Yours, if you ever get it to work. All these things are nothing but toys. End of the day, you're alone out there in the dark. All that counts is this. This is the book. This is the law. And you will be alone when you swear to uphold these ideals. For most of us, there is only death on the streets. Or for those few of us who survived old age, the prouder loneliness of the long walk into the unknown of the cursed earth to spend your last days taking the law into the outlands. There are medically disabled judges and there are dead judges. There are retired judges who've taken the long walk. Do not ever forget, cadets, that there is no such thing as a judge who has set aside those vows you will take. Class dismissed. The barge was three blocks long, solid and black. The mega city wall lock opened, and the barge poked its pitted nose inside, finally whined into silence as the lock took hold. A portal came open, and a crewman stepped out and nodded at the guard. Two loads from the prison factory in holder number nine, one from the mines in six, prisoner mail in two. The guard looked up from his computer tablet. No prisoners coming back? Just dead ones. He nodded back into the dark. Family's probably glad to get rid of them now that they gotta bury the bastards. The crewman stalked off. The guard stepped past him into a dimly lit hold. Fifteen body bags were strapped to the deck. Each had a yellow plastic tag stapled to his chest. Each bag was stenciled ASP. The guard leaned down to check the names. He heard the slight crinkle of plastic and jerked around. One of the body bags sat up, and the hair stood up on the back of the guard's neck. A pinhole slit appeared in the black body bag. A laser beam thin as a needle touched the guard between the eyes, and he was dead. Rico stepped out of the body bag and smiled at the guard. Home, sweet home, he said. The lights were always on and the streets were always wet in Mega City. Rico walked past the crowded taverns, past the hollow kill parlors where every kiss and cut was good as life and every crime was real. On a video screen he saw Vardis Hammond silently mouthing a replay of the city's block wars. The sign outside said, Geiger's Bazaar. Everything nobody wanted hung from the ceiling and the walls. Rico made his way through the maze. In the rear of the store, a fence guarded better merchandise. Geiger himself looked up and blinked. We're closed, he said. No, you're not, Rico said. You've got a package for me. Code name, Lazarus. The pupils in Geiger's eyes shrank to tiny points. Uh, give me a second, he muttered and disappeared. Rico waited. He timed Geiger. He was back in 29 seconds. Not too long. Nice place, he said. Yeah, it might look like junk to most people, but there's stuff in here that's real antiques. Valuable stuff, man. Rico nodded at a row of metal men in shadow behind the security fence. The tall figures looked hollow like toy soldiers some giant had cast aside. Not to run into something like that, Rico said. I thought they slagged all the ABC warriors after the last wars. Geiger shrugged. D Watts. Yeah, people collect them, got nothing else to do. They're fifty, sixty years old, not functional, of course. I like my old lady, you know. He handed Rico a long box. Rico set the box on the table and thumbed the lock. Holy! Geiger stood back. A black, perfectly pressed uniform was laid neatly in the box. On top of the uniform was an item any citizen of Mega City would recognize at once. The personal weapon of a judge, the lawgiver. Rico reached for the weapon. Geiger grabbed Rico's wrist. 
Oh, where you been, pal? That's a lawgiver. Don't you know that? They're programmed like they only recognize a judge's hand, the one the weapon was made for. I can get you something nice, but you touch that and that sucker will take your arm off. Rico smiled. Really? He gripped the lawgiver in both hands, squeezed the trigger. Everything above Geiger's shoulders moved six feet back. It looked as if someone had slammed a dozen pizzas against the wall. Rico frowned at the mess. I must be a judge, pal. What do you think? Rico unlocked the security fence and stepped inside. He studied the battered robots one by one. Finally, he stopped before a tall combat warrior, its metal hide dented in a dozen forgotten wars. You'll do just fine, he said. Stepping up on a plastic box, he studied the robot a moment, then removed a narrow panel on the side of its head. A nest of thin cables spilled out, dangling like silver dreadlocks. Rico patiently sorted them with practiced fingers. Finally, a golden spark hissed, lighting Rico's face and eyes. Faint sound began to whir in the warrior's head. The powerful torso jerked. A spasm shot through its right arm. Steam covered the monster in a mist, and its eyes glowed like rubies in his head. The eyes blinked once and turned on Rico. Status. Commander. Mission. The computer voice was old, and it rustled like a snake. Status' personal bodyguard, Rico said. Commander is me. Mission is... We're going to war again. Geronimo, pal. Lily Hammond had taken care of herself. Her husband's status as Mega City's top broadcaster enabled her to make regular appointments at Lovely U. My God, Vardis! Lily looked up from the paper in her hand. Uh, a conspiracy in the justice system? Radical elements on the city council? Where did you get this stuff? Hammond sat tapping on his lab computer. What do you mean, where did I get it? I followed up some grumblings I found on some low-level council papers. They confirm what I've known all along. The shadow of oppression goes deeper than the street judges. Much deeper. Vardis, they'll never let you put this on the air. Something like this could... It could bring down the council. Maybe it should, Lily. I wasted a lot of time investigating individual judges. The problem is the entire system, not just maniacs like Judge Dredd who... What the hell's that? Hammond turned as the door chimes sounded gently in the hall. He walked to the door. What is it? He said, jerking open the door. What are you... Hammond had nearly a quarter of a second to look at the black silhouette, the helmet without a face. The lawgiver coughed once. The judge stepped over Hammond's corpse and walked into the room. He was changing his shirt. His back, his shoulders, and his arms were tight with cords of muscle, the perfect symmetry of his upper body marred only by the harsh, pink ridges of tissue, scars earned in combat on the streets. A judge emblem was tattooed on his left shoulder. Hershey had one like it herself, only hers wasn't blurred where a killer's bullet had plowed an ugly groove. Dredd turned as he heard her behind him. You on today, Hershey? I'm on. They gave me an option day after... after that red quad fracas. And you didn't take it? Dredd nodded his approval. Is that really how you feel? It's just you out there? You against them? Don't you ever feel like... Haven't you ever had someone you felt close to? Have you ever had anyone you could call a friend? Yeah. Once. But what happened? She saw it then, for an instant, a shadow of pain across his features. And then it was gone. Dread, wait a minute, please. He stalked through the doorway into the tunnel, into the thunder of a hundred growling machines. I'm sorry, she said, reaching his side. I, I opened my big mouth, and I'm sorry. Dread looked at her with no expression at all. Do whatever you want. I have to work. So do you. They walked out of the semi-darkness at the curve of the tunnel. Four of them, visors down. 
They were dressed in combat armor like every other street judge there. Only their stance, their manner, marked them as a breed apart. Judge hunters. The men who watched the watchers. The law within the law. As Hershey watched, too stunned to move, they drew their law masters, made a tight left turn in perfect step. Everyone in the tunnel stood still. The hunters walked past Hershey, past the other judges, and stopped in front of Dredd. No! Hershey tried to breathe, but her throat went tight. Judge Joseph Dredd? Dredd was the only judge in the tunnel who had completely ignored the group. He turned and gave them a curious stare. The hunters took a step back. Don't move, Dredd. The leader held his weapon to Dredd's chest. Another stuck a paper in Dredd's face. You are under arrest, Joseph Dredd. We have the right to confiscate your weapon. We have the right to remove your badge. Should you choose to resist, we have the right to... I know your rights, Dredd told them. What is this? What's the charge? Murder. What? Who did I kill? You have the right to remain silent. We have the right to subdue you in any manner we choose, including green gas, skitters, or electronic restraint. Do you have any comments to make at this time, Joseph Dredd? Yes, Dredd said. Just one. You groons can go straight to hell. The screen flickered, brightened. The video suddenly focused on a hallway, a closed door. Digital numbers raced across the bottom of the image, blinking the time and the day. For a few seconds, there was nothing. Then a dark figure appeared, a figure in the unmistakable black armor of a judge. The judge drew his lawgiver and pressed the button inset in the door. The door opened. Light from the room flooded the hall. What is it? What are you... Vardis Hammond's face was stricken with fear. Dread! No! Please! A quick flare of light in the judge's hand. A nearly imperceptible sound. Hammond doubled over and fell. The judge stepped over his body, walked into the room, and closed the door behind him. Judge Hershey drew in a breath and held it. Beside her, Dredd stared at the screen, unable to believe what he was seeing. A low murmur swept through the council chamber. A full tribunal was a rare occasion. Seating had been bought in to accommodate the crowd. Judge Magruder, acting as a prosecutor, stood to Dredd's left. Judge Hersey stood to the right. Fargo had expressed his concern when Dredd announced that he had chosen a street judge as his counsel for defense. I trust her, Dredd had said simply, and that was that. Magruder faced the table of judges. The video you have just seen is a prima facie evidence that the defendant is guilty as charged. Market People's Exhibit Number. Objection, Your Honor. Hershey boldly stepped forward. The video we have just seen is inadmissible as evidence. I ask that it be rejected as people's evidence. If I may be allowed to explain, Your Honor, Judge Fargo nodded. Please do, Counselor. Thank you, Hershey said. She let her gaze touch each of the judges in turn. Since the uniform of a judge could easily be counterfeited, since the badge and every other accessory can be duplicated, and since neither video nor audio in prosecution's clip can identify positively the accused in any way, or anyone else for that matter, I repeat my objection to this video being entered as evidence in this case. She turned to Magruder, then to the table of judges. I am asking for a ruling, Your Honor. No one in the great chamber moved. Fargo slowly raised his head. He looked past the defendant and Hershey, past Judge Magruder and the media, and the black-clad judges. His gaze came to rest on the cadets, the young men and women who held the future of the city in their hands. The truth, the law, his decision was for them. Objection sustained. I find the prosecution's video evidence inadmissible in this tribunal. Chief Justice Fargo called a brief recess, and Magruder quickly went into a huddle with his staff. 
Hershey watched from the dais. She didn't have any aides. There was no one to talk to but Dredd. Dredd was stiff as a statue, looking straight ahead. She wondered what he was thinking. There had to be something going on in his head. The sound of Fargo's gavel echoed through the chamber. The room went silent once more. Magruder stepped back up onto the dais. Your Honor, in light of your ruling regarding evidence presented in this tribunal, I am forced to move to technical evidence which I believe is of a most critical nature. I will need the court's permission to access documentation marked Judge Secret from the central computer. The request is granted. You may proceed, Prosecutor. Central, are you online? Magruder said. Online, Judge Magruder. The voice was feminine. It was calm, reasonable, and soothing. I want you to access weapons schematics, Magruder said. Please describe the workings of the standard judge's firearm, the Lawgiver 2, and especially its improvements over the earlier Lawgiver 1. A rotating schematic of the Lawgiver, stark white on blue, appeared on the big screen at once. Seven years ago, the Lawgiver Model 2 replaced the Model 1. The difference between these models lies in two areas, the computer chip and the ammunition coating. Like the Model 1, the computer chip in the Model 2 recognizes the palm print of its owner. An imposter's hand will activate the weapon's alarm. The schematic dissolved into an animated figure. The figure pressed the trigger of a lawgiver and was promptly blown to bits in a clean, computer-generated explosion. Model 2 is somewhat different. It is coded to the personal DNA of the judge using the weapon via the skin's contact with the grip. A fail-safe security precaution. Hershey turned to Dredd. Did you know about this? No. Neither did I. I didn't think anybody did. The DNA is obtained from my medical files and upgraded automatically every time the weapon is reloaded. Each time a round is chambered and fired, the projectile is tagged with that relevant DNA. Hershey could see the whole thing now. Chief Justice, she said suddenly. The defense was unaware of this information, and I'm sure everybody else here is unaware of it, too. Let the prosecution finish, Judge Hershey, Fargo said. I'll hear from you later if you so desire. Magruder nodded. Central, were the bullets recovered from the bodies of Vardis and Lily Hamlin so DNA-coded? Yes, Judge Magruder. And what was the result of the computer check of the DNA coding of those bullets? The DNA is a perfect match for Judge Joseph Dredd. That's a lie. This is a setup. I did not kill those people. Dredd dug his fists into his palms, drawing blood. The cord stood out on his neck. He stared at Chief Justice Fargo. He didn't care about the rest of them. They could believe him or go to hell, but Fargo, if Fargo doubted him, if he thought for an instant that he had done such a thing, he turned to Hershey, gripping her shoulders hard. I wasn't there. I did not do this. I know you didn't, Dredd. I believe you, but I don't know what to do for you. The DNA evidence is irrefutable. He's left us without any case at all. Dredd dropped his hands. Everything he's saying is a lie. I'm telling the truth. What kind of case is that? It's the law, Hershey said. Magruder may be wrong, but the law is right, Dredd. You of all people know that. Dredd didn't answer. He looked at Hershey but didn't see her. He couldn't see anything at all. Your Honor, prosecution rests, Magruder said. The immense marble shield and eagle is the focal point of the Chief Justice study. Here is the emblem of power and the man at its foundation who makes that power real. Chief Justice Fargo stares out a small window overlooking the sprawling order and chaos of Mega City. What have I done? How could I have been so wrong? Dread, Rico, both of them homicidal? Only this time it will be impossible to cover up. Chief Justice, replied Judge Griffin. 
We carefully buried the Janus project nine years ago, along with Rico and all his victims. No one will ever learn of your involvement. Nothing that happened leads back to you. No. We can't hold it back this time, my friend. The media will know how close I am to dread. They'll dig it up until the whole mess comes out. The perfect excuse to ruin what little government, what little control we have left. Your motives were pure, Chief Justice. You thought Dredd was different, or you would have never spared him. Fargo sighed. And that little mistake may just bring down our whole judicial system. All of us. It won't just be me, you know. Once they get the taste of blood, they'll go after everyone who wears the badge. Griffin looked thoughtful. There is a way out, Chief Justice, if you'll forgive me. The long walk? Well, that's a death sentence, Judge Griffin. Mine! Uh, yes, it is your choice, of course. But that choice grants you certain rights. Yes. I will use the power of my retirement to save Dredd's life. Is this what was on your mind, Judge Griffin? Fine. If everyone sees this as my motive, so much the better. The judicial system we have worked these many years to establish will remain intact. And the secret of the Janus Project will be secure. What you do is more than anyone could ask of you. Your action shames us all, sir. We shamed ourselves, Judge Griffin, when we allowed ourselves to become involved in Janus. There is no need for all of us to pay for that foolish mistake, but I cannot say that it is asking too much for one of us to bear that burden. I wish it were someone else, Chief Justice. I would... I would take your place if I could, sir, and would consider it an honor. I appreciate the thought, Judge Griffin, but do not be in such a great hurry to give yourself to the cause. It is not necessary. Someone will make the decision for you one day, long before you're ready to be so noble yourself. The council chamber was hushed. The judges filed into the room. Their visors were down. Chief Justice Fargo struck the table with his gavel. Council Judge Esposito stood to speak for the tribunal. In the charge of the premeditated murder against citizens Vardis Hammond and Lily Hammond, we find the defendant Joseph Dredd guilty. Everyone in the room seemed to draw a breath at once. Chief Justice Fargo looked down at Dredd, determined to face him squarely, to do his duty and not turn away. Joseph Dredd, you are aware the law allows only one punishment for your crime, and that punishment is death. However, it has long been our custom to carry out the last order of a retiring judge. Fargo gripped the arm of his chair. And so now I step down. And as I do so, I exercise my right. As I leave to take my long walk into the cursed earth, I ask this court for leniency in its verdict against Judge Dredd. In gratitude for his years of dedicated service. Hershey was numb. She risked a look at Dredd. What she saw sent a chill up her spine. Dredd's eyes were dead, as dead as frosted glass. His mentor, the man who had been his father in nearly every respect, had just saved Dredd and sentenced himself to die. And Joseph Dredd hadn't blinked an eye. Chief Justice Fargo stood aside and formally relinquished his seat to Judge Griffin. We will honor your order, Judge Fargo. The sentence of death is revoked. 
Joseph Dredd is hereby sentenced to life in Aspen Prison. Griffin struck the table with his gavel as the court erupted into chaos. Sentence to be carried out immediately, he shouted above the crowd. This court is adjourned. Judge Griffin, this trial is a farce. Hershey stepped off the dais and glared at the Chief Justice. I demand an appeal. Enough, Judge Hershey. He picked up the book of the law and pointed it at her like a weapon. You will accept the council's decision, and you will accept it without question. He turned away from Hershey and pointed at Dredd. Remove the prisoner immediately. Get him out of here. The judge hunters appeared in Griffin's command, six of them, two marching swiftly down each aisle. Let the betrayal of the law be taken from our court. Griffin read from the book of the law. The judge hunters clamped manacles on Dredd's wrists. Dredd didn't seem to notice the judge hunters were there. Let the freedom he stole from others be stolen from himself. One of the judge hunters pushed Dredd roughly on the back. Dredd tripped and sprawled on the floor. Two hunters jerked him to his feet. Another tore off his armor and threw it aside. Still another clutched Dredd's black uniform at his throat and ripped it across his chest. Dredd didn't move. He stood perfectly still, solid as stone, while the hunters tore at his body, stripping him naked of his clothing, his honor, and his life. Let his armor be taken from him and all his garb of justice. Let his name be stricken from our rolls. Let his memory be erased from our minds. Let him live his life in dishonor and shame. And let him remember every day that he has not only betrayed himself, he has brought the shame and dishonor upon us. It is our regret that Judge Dredd cannot live a thousand lives in contemplation of his crime. Hershey was uncertain how long she had been standing there alone. The judge's table was empty. The audience was gone as well, the judges, the cadets. The section reserved for the media was empty. The vultures had fed well. She glanced at the two glasses on the table. A cadet steward had brought them water while they waited. Dredd had taken one swallow. Hershey had finished hers. She raised Dredd's glass, held it just below her lips. The faint, pleasant scent of lemon rose from the clear liquid. Hershey stared at the glass and brought it closer to her nose. She set down Dredd's glass and picked up her own. It was nearly empty, but there was enough there to smell. Nothing. No scent at all. The rage began to spread throughout her body. She clenched her fist in frustration, then grabbed up Dredd's glass and threw it against the wall. Hexadol 9? It wasn't the scent of a lemon. It was a powerful tranquilizer drug. The rigid stance, the frozen stare, didn't take much of the stuff to numb him to anything that was happening around him. They could have started a war right there and Dredd wouldn't have noticed. There was enough of the drug in his glass to... Who? Hershey wondered. Why was perfectly clear. Dredd would accept his own sentence, but he would have gone berserk when he learned of Fargo's sacrifice. This is Duncan Harrow with the news. I feel a little out of place, a bit uncomfortable sitting behind the news desk today. In my mind, this desk will always belong to a man who was revered and respected by the journalistic community and the citizens of Mega City for a number of years. This is Vardis Hammond's desk, and the tragic story unfolding before us today began with the brutal, senseless slaying of Vardis Hammond and his wife, Lily. The murder of the Hammonds and the conviction of Judge Dredd for that crime has led to another bizarre and startling development the retirement of Chief Justice Fargo himself, and the commutation of Dredd's death sentence to life in Aspen Prison. At sunrise this morning, retiring Judge Fargo was escorted by an honor guard of street judges to the city gate in the wall of Mega City. Judge Fargo wore the traditional white duster, 
the traditional lawman's wear from the period dating to the way back when. A young cadet, first in her class this year, read from the Book of the Law, and a chorus of cadets sang the solemn judge's anthem. The cadet read, Let him who has been written in our hearts and memories be struck from our hearts and memories forever. At this point, retiring Judge Fargo hands a bundle containing his uniform, lawgiver, and badge to the presiding cadet. The cadet hands Fargo the Book of Law and the one weapon he will carry to the cursed earth described as a Remington pump shotgun. The cadet salutes smartly. Judge Fargo returns the salute for the last time. Let him go from us, from our city, from our protection, from our presence forever. The city gates open, revealing the parched, empty land beyond. Judge Fargo walks through the gate and into the cursed earth. He has gone from our midst. He has left us forever. May he continue his pursuit of the right throughout his life. May he bring law to the lawless, justice to the unjust, as he leaves our sight forever. At this point, the great city gate closes behind Judge Fargo. The cadets and the honor guard of street judges come to attention, and the judge's anthem reaches its stirring climax. This concludes our report on the retirement ceremony of Judge Fargo, former Chief Justice of Mega City. I can report to you that at virtually the same instant this ceremony was taking place, another somewhat less formal event occurred at the northwest shuttle gate of our city. Here, 63 men in chains walked up the rampway to the Aspen Prison Shuttle number 11. At least one among them will spend the rest of his life behind those forbidding walls for the crime of double murder, a prisoner named Joseph Dredd. Duncan Harrow here. Good night. The walls of Chief Justice Griffin's apartment were simulated oak, a perfectly polished imitation of a material that had long since vanished from the earth. Griffin walked straight to the bar beside a heavy glass table. In a corner near the back was a bottle with a faded gold label. He brought the bottle out and held it into the light. The liquid inside was the dark and smoky hue of old gold. Real Scotch whiskey, Griffin said aloud. No simulations, not today. He heard the soft laughter behind him, jerked around and nearly dropped the precious bottle on the floor. The man stood in the center of the room, light from the fireplace glancing off the sharp planes of his face. But there was someone, something else, a darkness, a shadow that seemed to lift itself out of the substance of the floor behind the man, swell and grow until it nearly touched the ceiling itself. It hissed and groaned and steam rose from its dented metal joints. Griffin recognized the monster at once, an ABC robot, a relic of some ancient war. A thing like that here in his home? Are you out of your mind? Griffin stared at the man. Why did you bring that? That thing in here? I want it out of here at once. Rico smiled. The scotch is good. I tried it before you arrived. Chief Justice Griffin. It has a pleasant ring to it. I don't like this, Griffin said. You and that antique killer coming here. I said we'd meet somewhere safe. Rico swept his arm in a casual gesture. What are you worried about? That fool reporter is dead. The beloved Judge Fargo has taken the long walk. And Judge Dredd is on his way to Aspen Prison. <laughs> I do hope he gets my old cell. It's quite special. So isolated. So quiet. Rico looked into the fire. Fargo was no trouble, I assume. Griffin made a noise in his throat. With Dredd convicted, he didn't have any choice. He thought the long walk was all his idea. 
Dredd was the only one who could raise hell during the proceedings, and I made sure he kept quiet. I am not happy with the disposition of Dredd. He's an extraordinary man. I could have used him in this. No, you could not have used him in this. Rico swept Griffin's words aside. Dredd worships the law. And he would have blown you away the moment he found out how much you're pissing on it. Let him freeze his ass off in Aspen. Let him see what it's like to be me. After all, he and I have so much in common, don't we? Griffin said, There is a great deal of work to be done. I want chaos, Rico. The block wars were just the beginning. Now I want fear racing through every street. He slammed his fist against the wall. Then the council will have to turn to me. And when they do, I'll give them Janice. Rico rubbed a hand across his chin. Fear. Terror. Panic in the streets. I think I can handle that. The air in the hold was thick and foul. The odor was flatulence and fear, fury and the sour smell of sweat. The prisoners were chained to the hard metal benches. The guards stalked up and down the narrow aisle between them, riot guns close to their chests. Fergie knew who the guy was. He knew, but he knew he wasn't right, because it didn't make sense. There wasn't a chance in hell that the man who had put him in the stink hole was sitting next to him on the bench. Dread? Fergie couldn't believe it, but now he knew it was true. What are you doing here? I was convicted of a crime. Wrongly convicted. That's what happened. That's why I'm here. I don't want to talk to you. Leave me alone. You too. Fergie slapped his head. That makes two of us. How about that? No. That makes one of us. I remember you. Ferguson, Herman, interference with public droids, unlawful use of... Five years? I was saving my own miserable ass. You got an innocent man here. It was a big mistake, Dredd. The law doesn't make mistakes. Yeah? So what happened to you? How do you explain that? Dredd looked at his hands. I can't. I don't know. Reverend Billy Joe Angel fought the urge to reach beneath his robe and scratch his crotch. That was wrong. That was a sin. God wouldn't care for that. The Reverend rejoiced in God's blessing and the joy of the pain. He drew the hood tighter about his head and raised his face to the skies. He was blind, but he could feel the terrible wrath of the sun. It burned through ragged cloth, blistered his flesh, and seared him to the bone. Thou art good, O Lord. He prayed in his head. Thou hast sent me bountiful suffering and near unbearable pain. I thank thee for this empty and worthless land. For the merciless ball of fire thou hast placed over my head. For the tiny creatures of the earth that do constantly sting and bite this worthless body, which is unclean and eternally damned. Bring forth festering sores upon me and upon my wicked sons, the filthy spawn of my loins, the... Shallow coming, Pa? Mean Machine jumped up and down with delight. He hadn't seen a shuttle or heard a thing at all, but he knew. The same way he knew a lot of things since Pa had put the little tick thing in the hole upside his head. Junior Head Dead scrambled up the pathway, making pig noises with his mouth. He dragged the big boomer along behind him. You break that and Polly won't hit you for a week, Me Machine warned him. <laughs> Junior Head Dead dropped the handle of the boomer, snapped the shaky tripod in place, lifted the clumsy weapon and set it on the stand, bolted it into place. 
in an ancient incarnation in the way back when it might have blown the treads off a tank. Go! Go, go! cried Junior Deadhead. Going to catch me some city fired boys! He pulled the trigger and closed his eyes. Fire blasted out of the rear end of the weapon. It seared all the hair off the Junior's head. The missile whined and wobbled drunkenly in the air. Reverend Billy Joe Angel prayed for God to send vipers and maggots to his bed. Then, an instant before he heard the great din of retribution, the joyous sound of death, he felt the heat of the explosion on his face, felt the mighty flame of God's breath. Got to see this, Pa, Mean Machine shouted. Got him real good. Hallelujah, the Reverend Angel said. Dredd saw a ragged slice of blue sky and realized half the shuttle was gone. The broken shell that was still intact was trying to stabilize itself, bring itself down in one piece. Dredd knew microcomputers in the molecular structure of the hull were patiently firing thruster rockets to bring them out of the spin. The computers didn't know that there wasn't a ship anymore, just a twisted piece of scrap. Dredd heard his name shrieking in the wind. With an effort, he turned and spotted Fergie a dozen feet away. He was still strapped down, his fingers clutched tightly around the bottom of the bench. Dread, do something, he shouted. Get me out of here. Hold on, Dread told him. We're going down. This is your fault, Fergie said. You did this to me. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. You broke the law, Ferguson. You do the crime, you serve the time. What time? Ferguson stared. I haven't got any time. Thirty seconds, Dredd said. Maybe forty-five. <laughs> Shit! Fergie said. The corridors were dark. Griffin said, Welcome to Janus. You've been so anxious to see it, now you're here. There's a feeling in here. A sense of a beginning. Rico closed his eyes. Can you smell that, Griffin? Yeah, of course you can. It's an awakening, a dawning. The light says that. It's always dawn down here. Rico glared at Griffin. Who's in here? Someone is in here. The woman stepped out of the shadow into sight. She was tall, dressed in something blue. Her mouth was wide and red. Her eyes slightly tilted where the dark hair tumbled past her cheeks to her breasts. I know you, Rico whispered. I remember you. Yes, you do. You remember me. Her voice was a breath of chilly air. You're Ilsa Hayden. <laughs> the bitch who testified before the council. He told the judges I was insane. I was simply trying to help, Ilsa said. Griffin felt the struggle between them, the hunger and the need. Ilsa was the gift he had hoped for, the control he needed to keep Rico stable, to use him, to keep the howling psychopath inside this creature from emerging and destroying them all. The raw animal smell of this woman could bind him tighter than the strongest chain. Miss Hayden has been a loyal supporter of the project for some time, Griffin said. She has watched over it kept it alive for me. I'm certain you'll find her experience invaluable, Rico. Rico didn't blink. I'm most grateful. I'm sure I can use all the help I can get. You'll get your new order, Griffin. We'll take care of that, won't we, sweets? He winked at Elsa, then turned and whistled at the robot warrior looming dark at his back. Let's go, Fido. Daddy's gonna find you something to bite. Griffin stared back down the tunnel. The shadows were empty. No one was there. Yes, Griffin here. What is it? The micro-circuit in the silver threads of his collar scrambled his words, then released them in the clear at any destination in the world. Captain Arkins, sir. Judge Hunter searching abort Squad 7. Sir, we're at a wreck site. 
old Ohio sector. Griffin felt a cold blade twist in his gut. What wreck are we talking about, Captain? Don't waste my time, damn you. Aspen shuttle, sir, the one with... With Judge Dredd aboard? Griffin finished. Is he dead or alive? I want a positive ID either way. No guesswork, Captain. We're going through the wreckage now. I'm getting a picture online for you, Chief Justice. A holosphere blinked into life at Griffin's eye level. It rotated slowly, giving him a complete view of the area. The wreck was a black, twisted metal shell. Sir? Captain Arkin stepped into sight. There are 16 casualties here, but no sign of dread. Two men alive, one guard, and a prisoner. We found tracks leading away from the wreck site. At least a half a dozen men. I'm assuming Dredd was one of the survivors, sir. No, Captain, he was not. You are clearly in error. Captain Arkin nodded. Sir? I repeat, Joseph Dredd did not survive the shuttle crash. No one survived the wreck. Is that clear, Captain? Yes, sir. Perfectly clear, sir. Captain Arkin made his way back into the wreckage. A medic was squatting over the guard. Arkin waved him away. Thanks, the guard said. I'm grateful for your help. I'm glad you guys showed up. Arkin brought the blunt-nosed pistol from behind his back. No problem, he said. The locker room was silent. Hershey took a deep breath. Dredd's locker was 30914. Lock was easy enough to open if you knew how, and every cadet who'd gone through the academy did. She spotted it on the floor of the locker. A black slipcase, half an inch thick, with something inside. She drew it out and held it to the light. A frame from a home video, a young couple. The woman was holding a baby. Baby Dredd? Hershey shook her head. Didn't think you were ever a baby, pal. Turning the picture over, she slid her thumb along the rim. The frame popped open, another image inside. Two men, mid-twenties, in cadet blues. Graduation day at the academy. One of the men obviously a younger dread. The other? Who? Enough like dread to be related somehow. Hershey frowned. Not a relative. Couldn't be. Joseph Dredd didn't have anyone, any life at all outside of the judges. And even that family had finally rejected him, tossed him aside. Now he didn't have anyone at all. Fergie hurt too much to be dead. What the hell were the ugly groons doing over there? Snorting and sniffing, rooting through the junk they'd salvaged from the shuttle. Dredd was half a meter to Fergie's right, hanging from his hands, his legs dangling free. The building around them was a ruin. The ceiling above was caved in. The night was unbelievably dark. The stars colder and brighter than Fergie had ever imagined they could be. Listen, Dredd, Fergie whispered. It's your fault I'm in this mess. If I ever get out of here, you won't. What? It's against my nature to give up, Ferguson. Understand that. Given the chance, I will take several of these lawbreakers with me. Aside from that, it's pretty reasonable to assume we have little or no chance of escape. Especially if they're who I think they are. Fergie felt his throat go dry. And who, who would that be? Angels, Dredd said. Angels? Like in? No. Like in angels of death. God's maggots. Painters. Dirt chokers. One had a face like a toad. His nose was sewed shut with leather thread. He was scarcely wider than a stick. He had enormous green eyes. The hair on his face and head was scorched black and his skin was burned raw. This one still had a nose, but his ears were sewed shut. It was the third one that made Fergie want to throw up. The groon had a patchwork face, alternating squares of copper and flesh like a nightmare checkerboard. One arm was real, the other was a dull metal stub. 
There was something mechanical protruding from his head, but Fergie couldn't make it out. Hey, how about you? The creature caught Fergie looking and grinned. I kind of like you, man. I surely do. Something long and sharp touched Fergie's crotch. It trailed up to Fergie's belly and traced a narrow line. It was the longest blade Fergie had ever seen. I'm gonna like you real good, the man said. Real, real good. What do you think of that? Whatever you do, don't show him fear, Dredd said. Fergie felt something roll over and die in his belly. Thanks. I'll remember that, Dredd. Dredd? Did you say Dredd? Blessed be, Pa. We got us Judge Dredd himself. The two other freakos jumped up and down. Something walked out of the dark. Something tall and gaunt and bug-eaten rags that smelled. It shuffled past the fire, tapping its stick on the ground. He stopped and sniffed the air. His features were masked by the filth-encrusted hood. Yellow eyes winked at Dredd. Pa wants to know if it's true. We got a great man of the law himself. Well, is it Dredd? That be who you are? I'm Dredd. Hallelujah, the man in the hood said. I know who you are, Dredd said. You're the self-styled Reverend Billy Joe Angel, wanted on a 603, Crimes Against Humanity, a 529er, murder in every degree. You and your offspring are under arrest. Pa Angel howled. Oh, we are blessed, Lord. All we prayed for was food and sustenance. But thou hast delivered our great enemy into our hands. Pa says, I heard him, Dredd said. You're still under arrest. Dredd, Fergie shook his head. You keep saying that. You're going to piss this guy off. Listen, friend, there's been a little mistake. Him and me, we're not together. Yellow eyes poked Fergie sharply in the ribs. Told you I liked you, man. Didn't mean I liked you talking. Shut up! Yellow Eyes squinted at Dredd and Fergie. That's Pa. You better be real nice. He's an uh, authentic, baptized adventure of the Lord. He stabbed the air with his knife. You mess with him. You mess him with the fiery hand of God himself. They call me Me Machine. That's cause I am. He pointed a dirty finger at his head. Pa's got me set on number one. I had kind of an accident when I was born. Shit, being alive is a pure accident out here. Pa fixed me up best he could. He can turn me up all the way to number four. That's berserking, dog frothing psychomaniac is what it is. You don't want to never see that. The dumb-looking one is Junior Head Dead. The other one's Link Link. He can't get his bodily functions working right. If the wind was right, you could tell. He pricked Fergie's foot with the blade, turned the edge around and around in the light of the flame. We are mighty proud to have you here, Dredd. Mighty proud indeed. His blood swept out faster than any eye could see. A thin line of red appeared on Dredd's chest. You are hard to hurt, I bet. <laughs> Pa's gonna like that. Let me <coughs> kill it, Pa. Huh? <laughs> Link Link's face screwed up in a mask. Y you say I could have one, <coughs> Pa? Hallelujah, brother, Fergie cried out. Right on, glory to the Lord. May his mighty sword smite sinners from the face of the earth. May his wrath stomp down on the unbeliever. May he damn the rich and raise up the poor. Mean Machine gave Fergie a puzzled look. What are you doing? Why, why are you saying stuff like that? Pa Angel took a step forward. He turned his shrouded face up to Fergie. Could it be from the city of the foreign? A feat for one has appeared. 
Amen, Fergie shouted. The sheep's come home, man. That's me. Ferguson. Dredd shook his head in disgust. You don't want to do this. Believe me, you don't. Yeah? Think again, unbeliever. Mean Machine turned to his brothers. Cut him down. If Pa says this is a believer, but I reckon he is. Fergie laughed as Link Lincoln Jr. head dead scrambled up the post to cut him free. The law doesn't make mistakes, Dredd, right? But I'm free and you're toast. Go figure, man. Wrong. I'm toast, Ferguson. You're meat. What's that supposed to mean? These are angels, dopehead. They're cursed earth scavengers. Scumbags. They're also cannibals. Fergie stared. Hey, no way. Don't go telling me shit like that, Dredd. Don't even joke about it, man. He turned to me, Machine. Right, pal? Tell him, brother. Hallelujah! Pa Angel shouted. <laughs> Said Junior, head dead. This is terrific, you know? I mean, meeting you guys, a bunch of other believers out here in the middle of nowhere. Now, what's the chance of that? Is that God's will or what? Glory! Link Link said. <laughs> said Junior Deadhead. Fergie winked and did a little bantamweight shuffle. Link Link and Junior were leading him down a narrow passage through the ruined building. All Fergie wanted to do was get far enough away from the big spook himself and that lunatic with the muck and machete for an arm. Get his bearings straight, lose these freakos, and get the hell out of town. So, Fergie said, uh, we're going where? Out for some air or what? I mean, a quick tour is fine with me. I don't have to be back or anything. God is good. Glory to his name. Fergie looked at Link. Fella, you got to get to a dock sometime. They could fix up that little problem you got with the nose. I mean, you know, no offense. Like, the leather works. Very attractive and all, but uh, Link Link looked confused. Can nobody fix nothing except Pa. Pa's reorder that is, and pa, pa says if I were walking God's misery and pain, I can get the holy galgen when I'm 15. Me and the team will get it next year, and, and I'm after that. Fergie's throat went dry. All the meals he'd missed stirred a queasy soup in his belly. You're not saying that like... What, what I think you're saying. Pa's got it all, Link Link said. The whole b -b blessed mutilation of God. Ears and eyes and nose sewed up, and his m mouth too. He's the only angel got that. So he has sewed up every wicked orifice against the evil world. He's shut out sin and cast Satan aside. He's become a pure uh, uh, abomination of the Lord. Look, I got some private hygiene stuff, and you fellas have plenty to do, so if you can just point me outside... Link Link kicked Fergie, who bit a mouthful of floor. Link Link straddled Fergie's back. Junior wound a piece of rusty wire around his hand, then looped the other end around his feet. They dragged Fergie on his belly down the hall. Wait, wait a minute, Fergie said. I'm a believer. I'm a, I'm a maggot of God, just like you. That's why we love you, brother, Link Link said. They flipped him over on his back. Fergie looked straight at a bed of hot coals. He looked at the heavy iron spit and the thing that was crackling there, crackling red and black, juices hissing down into the fire. Fergie threw up. 
Them unbelievers, Link said. Just don't taste right, you know? It's impure flesh is what it is. Fergie closed his eyes. Hey, this is a gag, right? I, I want I want you to tell me that th this is a gag. Junior kicked Fergie in the mouth. He grabbed his hair and pulled him closer to the fire. He drooled on Fergie's head. Link found a knife somewhere in his rags, reached out and sliced off something from the spit. No, the unbeliever's flesh is unclean, Lord, but a per per person's gotta eat. I, I was lying, Fergie yelled. I don't believe in anything. I mean, I don't even believe enough to be an unbeliever. So what do you think of that? I mean, that is something you don't want to mess with, man. I also got this skin condition. I got athlete's foot, guys. Glory, Link said. <coughs> Junior Deadhead said. Pa says the Lord sure been good. Says it's a sign dropping you from the sky into his hands, said Mean Machine. Why don't you tell Pa to get the mush out of his mouth, Dredd said. You think God understands that crap? Even if he's listening, he's sure as hell not listening to Daddy Dust Bunny over there. Mean Machine's knife arm swept out in a wicked arc. Dredd felt something like the breath of Arctic air across his chest. He forced himself not to look down. He knew he would see a line of red, a cut no deeper than Mean Machine wanted it to be. He did what he liked with that thing and he did it with surgical skill. You bring in wrath and retribution down onto yourself, Dredd. The Lord is fearsome in his gaze, Mean Machine said. He will smite you down and grind you under his heels. Your flesh will tremble with terror of his ways. You ever been in a rumble in Red Quad, pal? You don't know shit about the terror of his ways. Enough! The Reverend Billy Joe Angel raised one filthy hand above his head, then lowered it slowly until it stabbed at dread. Finish him, son. Finish him now. Mean Machine glowed. I'll finish him, Pa. I surely will. Free boy. You can go up to three. Three? I can go up to... You mean it, Pa? Oh, glory, I'm gonna do a three. Mean Machine tapped the top of his mechanical head. His mouth fell open, his eyes turned to glass. His whole body shook. His arms and his legs jerked straight out like a droid in happy oil. The copper squares on his face turned blue and red. He squealed, lowered his head, and came straight at Dredd. His head hit Dredd in the gut. Dredd gasped for air. The pain nearly took him. The cords around his wrist had snapped tight, tearing at the muscles in his shoulder and his chest. Dredd knew he couldn't take it again. The freako would break something vital, and he'd bleed to death inside. He made himself smile through the pain. That's it. That's the whole bit. And this is what you do. Mean Machine was dumb, but he wasn't as dense as Dredd had hoped. He knew the damage he'd done. He knew what would happen when he came at Dredd again. That was my practice run, Mean Machine said. I got you sighted in good now. Quit talking and do it then, Dredd said. You're starting to piss me off. The computer room gave Hershey the creeps. Olmeyer took a seat at the computer station and pulled up an extra chair. I appreciate what you're doing, Hershey said. I want you to know that, cadet. The screen blinked. Picture of Dredd as a baby swam into view. Dredd and his parents. The same picture Hershey had found in his locker. Hershey watched, stunned, as the elements of the picture began to fade and disappear. Olmeyer spread his hands. That's it. Sky, foreground, house, parents. All a fake, Judge. Every line of it. Everything except the baby. Baby's real. Rest of it is zero. Zilch. It doesn't exist.
quit talking and do it, Dredd said. You're starting to piss me off. Mean Machine threw back his head and laughed. <laughs> He's just a spoofing, Pa. He's hurt bad. Real, real bad. I heard stuff crunkle inside. The Reverend Billy Joel Angel raised his wooden shaft. Bring him to God, boy. Bring him to God. I'll do it, Pa. I will. I'll bring him to God real good. His yellow eyes flashed. Is this a, a number four, do you think, Pa? You think maybe it is? Four. Pa bellowed. Four. Shouted Mean Machine. Four. 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 Mean Machine reached up to his shiny silver head and dialed himself a four. His mouth fell open. Blue fire crackled in his eyes. A low sound started in his gut, trembled up his body and out his throat in a raged roar. He swept in a dizzy circle around the fire, twisting and turning and shaking himself in a frenzy and a froth. Then, with a howl, he lowered his head and came straight for dread. Glory! 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 Dredd knew exactly how this maniac's charge had to end. He would hit him with the impact of a truck, and all of Dredd's organs would spurt out of his ears. He tensed the muscles in his belly and his thighs. Everything hurt. Dredd opened his mouth and roared, lifted his body at the waist, snapped his legs straight out. His boots met the top of Mean Machine's head. Mean Machine's speed kept him going for a second and a half. He stopped, then shook all over, and staggered off in a ragged, dizzy course. His head found the wall. He turned on his heels and stumbled off toward Dredd again. The deadly blade whirred above his head. Smoke came out of Mean Machine's nose. Dredd jerked his body aside, felt the blade hum by, wrapped his legs around the metal head. Dredd closed his eyes against the pain and lifted Mean Machine off the ground. The pole holding Dredd's hand snapped. He fell in a heap, came to his feet, and ripped the leather thongs from his wrists. Mean Machine came at Dredd again. Dredd lifted half the broken pole, swung it in an arc at Mean Machine's head. Mean Machine went down, shook himself, and came to his feet again. Okay, Dredd said. I get the message, friend. You can take it in the head. Forget about the head. Mean Machine jerked up straight, scanned the room, and settled on Dredd. Don't like you anymore. Like you real good, but don't like you no more at all. We got a problem then, Dredd said. You don't like me, and I'm still fond of you. He whirled the broken pole above his head. Mean Machine came at him. Dredd let go. The pole struck Mean Machine solidly at the knees. Mean Machine yelled and went down. His eyes rolled back in his head. Dredd moved in to finish him off. The earth exploded at his feet. Dirt and stone geysered into the air. Dredd threw himself to the ground, rolled and came up on his knees. The Reverend Billy Joe Angel had an antique automatic weapon in his hand. He was screaming out a hymn and blasting every corner of the room. Dredd tried not to move. A blind man with a weapon like that was a hazard to everybody's health. Mean Machine suddenly came to life. Pie Angel centered on the sound. Lead stitched a nasty fence around Mean Machine. Shit, Pa, it's me. It, it ain't him. He's over that away. Dredd picked up half a brick, tossed it across the room. Pie Angel turned in a blur and blasted the brick to bits. Dredd went low and scurried along the wall into the narrow hall. He stepped out of the corridor and into the small room. Across the room, something that used to be a prisoner or a guard sizzled on a spit. A few feet away, one of Pie Angel's loonies was basting Fergie's naked backside with half a broom. The other hummed a hymn. Fergie's hands and feet were bound to the spit. He squawked and rolled his eyes. Dredd walked up behind Link Link, picked him up by the collar and tossed him against the wall. Link Link's head made a terrible sound. Junior Head Dead turned and stared. He drew a long-barreled pistol from his belt. His reaction time was six months slower than Dredd's. Dredd took the weapon from his hand, turned it around, pulled the trigger, and shot Junior in the head. Dredd stood watch while Fergie got into his clothes. Someone roared down the hall. Pie Angel or Meme Machine, Dredd couldn't tell. Come on, he said. I don't want to stand around here. Fergie looked at him. What are you going that way for? 
Man, I'm headed the other way. I'm not going back there. I'm not through in there, Dredd said. Shut up and stay behind me. Pick up a brick. When no appropriate weapons are available, utilize those materials at hand. Judges, how to cover your ass, right? Dread. Survival against all odds. I wrote the course. I had to ask. Normal behavior for lawbreaker scum. I asked a lot of questions, never listened to anything anyone says. Did you write that too? No, Dread said. You did. You've been living it all your life. You and all your kind. That's why there's us. Us? Us. Judges. As long as there are people who think the world is their lunch, there has to be someone to show them they're wrong. Now button it up and stay close. At the end of the hallway, Dread waved Fergie to a halt. The dying fire caught a dim point of light. Metal. Mean Machine's head. He was still laid out where Dread had left him. The Reverend Billy Joe Angel was sitting on the ground by his son. Dredd touched Fergie's arm, signaled him to stay where he was. Fergie nodded. Doing anything else had never crossed his mind. Dredd took a cautious step into the room, kept his eye on the shadow across the room. Junior's long-barreled weapon was at his side. He took another step, come up behind the shadow, take the old man out, make sure Metal Dome was dead, look for any more weapons, and... He heard the rush of air, had a quarter of a second to duck, curse himself, and remember chapter nine of his own damn book. When you think the area's secure, chances are it's not. Then Pie Angel Staff hit him squarely on the side of the head, and he went down like a rock. Dredd felt the ground coming up. Plenty of time to think. Hour, hour and a half. Time works different somehow. Wham, drop, fall on your face, stationary target, Get the hell up. He clobbers you again and you're flat-ass dead. Dredd pushed the darkness aside, just enough to wake up motor control for a tiny little nudge to the right. Not bad. Good. He hit the dirt hard. Pie Angel's staff came down again. Missed. Pie Angel kicked him in the knee. Dredd howled and rolled away. He thought about Herman Ferguson. What was he doing that was more important than this? Your own damn fault, Dredd. Count on a criminal type and you deserve whatever you get. He saw the scarecrow loom up above him. The weapon raised up behind his shoulders, ready for the kill. He watched the dirty hood fall away. Saw the scarred and razored flesh. Saw the leathered thongs tangled in strange configuration, lacing the horror's ruined face, covering the darkness where ears and nose and mouth and eyes and madness used to be. The Reverend Billy Joe Angel bellowed out his rage and swept his weapon down, and Dredd knew he didn't have time, that this was the one where he wouldn't walk away, the one where a blind man had fooled him with a stick and a pile of smelly rags when he wasn't really there. <laughs> Something exploded in the rag man's belly and scattered him in several bloody parts. Dredd pulled himself up, stared at the judge hunters dropping from the ceiling, blasting through the wall, following the drill the way they'd been trained to, fast and quick, and clean. One, two, three, maybe more outside, but only three in here. Dredd threw himself at half a wall as gunfire stitched a pattern at his feet. A visored figure came right at him, firing his weapon. Dredd pulled Junior Head Dead's revolver from his belt, squeezed the trigger, and fired. The hunter paused a fraction of a second, thrown off his guard. Dredd came in low. The gun clattered to the ground. Dredd raised up, jerked the hunter's helmet off his head and slammed it across the man's jaw. He heard the sound behind him, knew there were two, picked up the lawgiver, fired it in a circle an inch above the ground. The first man went down. Dredd swung his weapon by the barrel and smashed the hunter's face. He glanced at the hunter he'd shot in the foot. The man cursed him and started up again. Dredd kicked him soundly in the head. Fergie walked out of the corridor clutching half a brick in his hand. You're not going to finish him off? Why the hell not? Dredd looked at him. Because I'm innocent, remember? Fergie shrugged. Yeah, I remember. So? You think those groons give a damn about that? Thanks for jumping in, Dredd said. I appreciate the help. Hey, I was ready, you know. You were terrific, man. I, I said to myself, I said, Fergie, 
You can hop in the ring and finish these guys, but if you do, you're going to knock Dredd's timing off. You're going to... Shit, Dredd. Dredd swung around in a blur. The hunter was up on his knees, finger on the trigger of his weapon. His head exploded in a shower of red. Dredd stared at the man in the doorway, a dark silhouette against the stars. The Remington hanging from his hand, the long duster coat. Ex-Chief Justice Fargo showed him a weary grin. Welcome to Cursed Earth, Joseph. Hell of a place we've created here. I guess hell's the right word for it, all right. Those columns, that piece of carving up there. This is the courtroom, Joseph. Or used to be. That part of a face up there. That's the blind lady. Justice. Before your time. Uh, mostly before mine, too. She treated everyone the same. No favors, no secrets. The jury of ordinary people. <laughs> Hard to believe that one, but it's true. They decided, not us. We should never have taken the law out of their hands. Dredd shook his head. You had to. You brought order out of chaos. He saw Dredd's confusion. To be a judge, to decide the fate of thousands of lives during your career, I think that's uh, too much power in one man's hands. Too much, Joseph. For me, for you, for any man. Dredd read the doubt in the old man's eyes, the sorrow and regret. I once tried to compensate for that, he said. To strike some kind of balance. To eliminate the mistakes we might make. To put justice beyond the possibility of error. We tried to... To create the perfect judge. We called it Janice. Dredd frowned. I don't understand, sir. I've never heard that name before. Fargo shook his head. No, no, you haven't. It was 40 years ago, Joseph. To create the perfect judge, DNA samples were taken from all members of the council. Samples were analyzed and studied. One was chosen for the Janus Project. Mine. It was then refined again and again, altered to enhance the best qualities and screen out the worst. Weaknesses, frailties any physical or mental characteristics that might obstruct the purpose of the project. We... We created you, Joseph. Dredd's breath caught in his throat. Me. Sir, that couldn't be. I had real parents. I wasn't made by any project. Yes, you were, Joseph. No. Joseph. Dredd gripped Fargo's arm. My parents were killed when I was just a kid. They told me at the academy. You told me. It was a lie. But I have a picture of my parents. You have a fake. A lie. Fargo shook him off. We lied to both of you. Both of... Both of who? Fargo wouldn't look at him. There was another person created in that experiment. But something went wrong, terribly wrong. Dredd blinked in sudden understanding. I have a brother? Yes. And what went wrong with him? Is he dead? Did he die? No. He didn't die. You were best friends at the academy. Inseparable. Both of you star pupils. Then he... turned. Went bad. We didn't know it until then. We created one perfect judge and another who genetically mutated into the perfect criminal. Fargo stopped. And for his crimes, you judged him. Dredd came to his feet, fists clenched at his side. Rico? You let me judge my own brother, and you never told me? I couldn't, Joseph. You were like a son to me. 
A son? Dredd's hand swept out and grabbed the water jar from Fargo, shattered it against the wall. Rico had to be killed, Fargo said. To protect you, to protect the city. To protect yourself, you mean. Yes, that's true. God help me, I cannot deny that. I did it for myself, for all of us, for... Wait, wait. It struck him then like a physical blow. Rico, he's not dead. He stared at Fargo. Rico's still alive. Fargo looked at his hands. No, he's not dead, Joseph. He's alive. I signed the order myself. He's in Aspen Prison, special quarters there. I couldn't, I, I just couldn't destroy him, whatever he was. He's part of me, part of you. Dredd struck his fist against the wall. Damn it. Don't you see it? He gripped Fargo's shoulders. I didn't kill Hammond. He did. It was his DNA that convicted me. Our DNA. It was Rico. I don't know where the hell he is right now, but he's not in Aspen prison. All the color drained from Fargo's face. He looked up at Dredd. Griffin! It has to be! There's no one else. He's deceived us both, sent us both to hell, and brought Rico back. The Janus Project? Yes, of course. Fargo's eyes went cold. He's going to do it. He's going to activate the project. Open up that box of horrors again. Dredd shook his head. No, he won't. Griffin can't do anything without Rico. We get to Rico, and we stop Griffin cold. There are ways to get into Mega City. We both know that. It's not that easy. You don't know, Joseph. I know I can sit on my butt in this pest hole and die. Dredd's voice clattered off the walls. I know I will not do that, sir. He took my badge away from me. That's all I ever had, and I will get it back. Fargo slowly pulled himself to his feet. Mean Machine screamed, a high-pitched, senseless babble of sound, a hymn of joy and death. Fargo sucked in a single breath. Mean Machine's blade arm ripped through Fargo's back, lifting him clean off the ground. This is Duncan Harrow with the news. According to our sources, a squad of seven lawmaster-mounted judges arrived on the scene at the Mega City Bank. Minutes later, four more street judges reported in at the site. The judges entered the bank in what is reported as a standard intervention wedge. Only seconds later, an explosion ripped through the building, sending flaming debris into the street. Now, early reports indicate that all 11 of the judges are casualties, as well as an undetermined number of bank employees and citizens. Duncan Harrow here with a special bulletin. Only moments ago, tragedy struck again in Mega City. At two minutes after one this afternoon, an explosive device of undetermined strength detonated in the street judge locker room deep inside the Hall of Justice itself. Though no official will comment at this time, there is little doubt that this tragedy and the earlier massacre of judges and civilians at the Mega City Bank are most certainly connected. This is Duncan Harrow. Good night for now. This is Tommy Waco with the news. This part of the story has not been on the news. Another person lost his life in that chaotic event in the Black Quad. A colleague, a friend, and a fine journalist. Duncan Harrow died in that same alley tonight. Duncan's car was found parked several blocks from the alley in question, but Duncan's remains, along with his blackened video camera, were found several feet within the alley itself near the scene of the disaster. It was like Duncan Harrow to put himself in harm's way in order to bring you the news. That's the kind of man, the kind of reporter, Duncan Harrow was. 
a man very much like another journalist, we sorely miss, Vardis Hammond. Now, maybe it's no longer safe for a journalist to speak to you in this manner, but here it is. Vardis Hammond felt that much of the lawlessness in Mega City could be laid at the feet of those very persons responsible for upholding the law. I'm speaking of the High Council of Judges itself. This is Tommy Waco with the news. Back to you, Katie Clough, for an on-the-scene report from the site of the tragic Black Quad massacre. Craning his neck, looking nearly straight up, Fergie could see the broad stripe of gold, the dying sun's reflection on the great mega-city wall. In a moment, the stripe disappeared at the top of the wall half a mile high. Now, as the darkness began to gather in, he could clearly see the glare of flame low on the wall, not twenty yards ahead. A brief puff of smoke appeared and vanished in the air. It's a vent from one of the city's incinerators, Dredd explained. There's a burst twice a minute. That means we got thirty-second intervals to get through the tube before it flames again. That means you're out of your mucking mind, Fergie said. Come on, get up, let's go. No way, man. What's wrong? What's wrong? Fergie stared. Are you kidding? You're going to get me killed. You're... Oh, God. Look at that. A fireball roared out of the vent, a tongue of flame thirty feet long. Fergie felt the heat on his face, smelled the charred remains of a million garbage cans. Dredd waited until the flames died down, then walked up to the edge of the vent, keeping close to the wall. Do what you want, he said. I'm going in. I got things to do. There's a maniac loose in Mega City. And there's another one loose out here, Fergie said. Great time I'm having. I'm out of Aspen, I got a new life ahead, right? Wrong. I'm crashing in a shuttle, cannibals think I'm catching the day. Now I got fireballs up my ass. I, I, I owe it all to you. Thanks so much, Dredd. Dredd looked at him. Me? You're blaming me? Of course I'm blaming you. If you hadn't arrested me on false charges, I wouldn't be here in the first place. No, I'm staying right here, Dredd. Someone arrests me? Fine. All right. Until you apologize. Dredd looked at him. The law doesn't apologize, Ferguson. Do I have to remind you of that? So? You're not a judge anymore. I gotta remind you of that? Dredd looked tired. Ferguson, what difference does it make? What if I was sorry, which I'm not? This is gonna change your life or what? Fergie brought himself to his feet. He looked at the dark horizon. He didn't look at Dredd. I'll bet you've never said those words in your life. Not ever. You owe that to me, Dredd. Dredd cocked his head and looked at Fergie as if he'd just dropped in from Mars. I'm supposed to say exactly what? I'm sorry. That's it. That'll do fine. I'll review your case, Ferguson. Review? Review is good. I'll accept that. That's a start. It's a... Hey, Dredd! Dredd picked Fergie up by the waist and tossed him into the chute. Go, Ferguson. Thirty seconds. Run! No! Fergie turned and started back. Dredd was right behind him. He stiff-armed Fergie in the back and sent him sprawling down the chute. Twenty-eight, twenty-seven, twenty-six, Fergie said. Stop counting, Droog. Dredd shouted, move. Twenty-two, twenty-one, twenty, twenty... Where was I? Dredd, I'm gonna fry. Right. I'll make sure you don't. Dredd racked a shell into the chamber of Fargo's gun. Fergie looked over his shoulder, saw the weapon pointed at his head. Okay, okay, I'm running, I'm running. Fifteen, fourteen... Fergie heard a low rumble, then a tremor he could feel through his boots. A thunder so deep it shook the walls. Something flickered far ahead, something bright and red. The sight nearly stopped his heart. The fireball coming right at him. God, he couldn't be that slow, he still had time. Damn you, Dredd, you were wrong. Maybe it wasn't thirty seconds, Dredd said behind him. Maybe it was something else. Oh, shit! Dredd suddenly stopped. He reached out and grabbed Fergie's collar and jerked him to a halt. Fergie stared. 
Dredd shoved him against the wall. He braced himself and fired the Remington at the floor to shoot. He pumped the weapon again and again. At first he felt blood in his ears. Through a veil of dirty smoke, he saw the twisted grate at Dredd's feet. Dredd kicked it with his boot. Kicked it again. The grate gave way with the clatter and vanished in the dark. Dredd's gesture was perfectly clear. Fergie jumped into the dark hole. Half a second later, he saw the fireball roar overhead, felt the awful heat, smelled the hair burning on his head. Fergie flailed his arms in the air. He hit something soft, plowed through it, didn't stop. Struck bottom on his knees, came up hacking and spitting black ash. Felt Dredd's boots hit his back and went down again. A dim light from somewhere to the right. Dredd rose from the dark, his face black with soot. You admitted you got it wrong, Fergie said. I did what? You said maybe it wasn't 30 seconds. You, you said it was maybe something else. So what? So it, it wasn't 30. It was maybe 13? It wasn't 13. You don't know. You don't know that. It might, may have been, I don't know, 12. Shut up, Dredd said. He ran down the alleyway behind 2023rd Street, Fergie close behind. There were screams from the street, the sound of breaking glass. A looter with dragons tattooed on his face raced by with a holo set. Now and then he saw judges. Some of them were holding back the crowds. Some of them were dead. He used all the courage at his command to keep from jumping in to help, to fight beside his friends. He knew he couldn't do it, that he had to stop Rico if he could. Besides, he was a fugitive now. Even men who knew him might kill him if they could. That hurt. That hurt a lot. Almost as much as watching the people of the city tear his world apart. Getting into the Hall of Justice wasn't hard. Every veteran judge knew how. The judge in the locker room turned, startled. Dredd hit him carefully, a point below his neck. The man sagged. Dredd eased him to the ground and began stripping off his uniform. It wouldn't quite fit, but that was fine. Ah, oh, hell, why not? Fergie rolled his eyes. What else can they do to me? I'm dead already. They catch me and they can't kill me twice. Don't count on it, Dredd said. The lighting is subdued in the council chamber. The somber atmosphere reflects the mood of the justices themselves. They know this is not a time for secrets or evasions or half-truths in council politics. This is a time of reckoning, of honest exchange, of sharing the strength, the wisdom, and the craft that brought them where they are. This is the time when they will perish or survive. Judge Esposito. This is the latest casualty report. Ninety-six judges have been assassinated. Now, I'm sure that's a conservative figure. Our lines of communication are severely disabled. Property loss, civilian deaths, we can't keep up with that. Judge Magruder, whoever's behind all this is familiar with our every procedure. They have our security measures, they even know our scrambler frequencies. Nothing is safe. They know everything we do. Judge Esposito, with only a handful of judges on the street, riots are breaking out all over Mega City. We don't even have emergency personnel anymore. We don't have anyone to send. The situation is critical. Judge Silver. It's more than critical. It's a disaster. We cannot replace these judges, even if we put the cadets on the street, which is an action I cannot bring myself to think about. We would not be at full strength for years. Judge Magruder. We don't have years, my friend. I doubt very much we have days. And mark my words, with nothing to control them, they'll be up here, at our door next. You can bet on that, Chief Justice Griffin. There is a solution, you know. It's there. And perhaps this is exactly what it was designed for. Project Janus. Judge Magruder. Chief Justice Griffin, the mere mention of that name, that... Abomination is intolerable and grounds for impeachment. Judge Silver. No, it's unthinkable, sir. Out of the question. This council tried to play God once before. It almost destroyed us then. Chief Justice Griffin. And if this wholesale slaughter of judges continues, then what, Judge Silver? 
We shall surely be destroyed if that occurs. What possible purpose would that serve? If we bring Janus into play, it can... Judge Esposito. It can what? A new batch of test tube babies won't solve this crisis, Chief Justice. We do not need reliable judges 20 years from now. If we're going to survive, if this city is going to survive, we need help this minute, today. Judge Silver. I quite agree. And with all due respect, Chief Justice, we have a desperate emergency here. A problem of the moment. This is not the time to speak of measures whose ends none of us will be here to see. If, indeed, we dare to consider such an action, Chief Justice Griffin. But I am not speaking of procedures that would take years, Judge. I would hope you'd give me more credit than that. No, you are all right. All of you. We cannot wait. And in truth, we don't have to. Science has come a long way since we initiated the Janus Project. Accelerated growth incubators are far more technologically advanced than they were at the time. We could create adult subjects now, fully grown and trained at birth. We could replace the judges we've lost in a week. The holo blinked into life before the council table. A perfect sphere, a small blue world turning slowly in the inner space of the council chamber. Central, Griffin said. Utilizing current technology, give me a time factor on the ability of the Janus Project to produce a fully grown adult subject. Priority reply. At once, a solid field of zeros and ones began crawling across the sphere. Given the current status of genetic engineering, an adult subject could be incubated and completed in 8.22 standard hours. My God! Judge Esposito sat straight up. Stop this, Chief Justice. Stop it now! Griffin didn't look at him. I believe you agreed to consider the project along with the others. I withdraw that agreement. I don't believe procedure allows for that. Esposito glared. I don't give a damn what procedure says. He jerked his head toward Griffin. What he's doing is, is criminal. You're fools, both of you, if you let him continue with this. Carl, Magruder leaned in and laid her hand on his arm. Carl, it's a presentation. We agreed to that. It doesn't have to go any further. Esposito started to speak. Griffin glanced at him, then turned to the shining sphere. In what quantity, Central? Give me a projected number of incubated and completed subjects. Laboratory number one of the Janus Project is currently equipped with 100 subjects. Under fully operational conditions, 700 subjects could be completed in seven days. Judge Silver stared at Griffin in disbelief. That many? If this is true, we could replace our losses in one day. Exactly. Griffin said. We could regain adequate control of the city almost at once and clean out the riotous elements in every sector. Why, before the week is out, we could reinforce trouble spots at such a strength that these unruly dissidents would think twice about showing their faces in the streets again. These unruly dissidents you're talking about are people, human beings, Chief Justice. Esposito watched the blur of data flashing across the sphere. People, not numbers. Magruder shook her head. He's right. We shouldn't even be considering this. It's, it's inhuman. The whole concept was inhuman from the beginning. It is madness, sir. It is not the council's job to play God. Judge. Griffin spread his hands and smiled. Madam, we sit in judgment of our fellow citizens because we must because order is necessary for the continuation of a peaceable society. If there was no need for such supervision, we could disband and go frolic in the park. Don't you patronize me, Chief Justice? Magruder came to her feet. She glared at Griffin and jabbed her arm at the shimmering globe. Central, restore the security blocks on the Janus Project at once. 
Griffin smiled. I'm afraid you can't simply vote all by yourself, Judge. We are a council here. We act together. He looked at the others. I find it most painful that I have to handle this myself without your help and support. I am deeply hurt that none of you have the will or the strength that these dangerous times require. Central, Griffin spoke without looking up. Janice will remain unlocked. My command only. Authority, override Mega City Emergency 195. Esposito came to his feet. This is treason, sir. You have gone too far. You have sealed your fate here, Chief Justice. No, Griffin said. I'm afraid that you have sealed yours. Rico, in here. He spoke without moving his eyes from Esposito. Rico walked into the great room. He wore the full-dress combat black of the judges. He held the lawgiver straight down at his side. He looked at the council and smiled. Magruder's face was drawn, frightened. Damn you, Griffin. Damn you to hell for this. That kind of talk is not constructive, Judge, Griffin said. Send him away. Stop this horror at once. Judge, Griffin let out a breath. I have to ask you to... Magruder's left hand dipped beneath the table. Rico seemed to make little effort at all. Magruder's head slammed into the massive slab at her back, spattering the marble red. Silver cried out once. Esposito didn't move. His eyes were on Griffin as he died. Rico smiled, studying his weapon as if he'd never seen it at all. Who said politics is boring? I might run for office sometime. A pall of acrid smoke hung over the room. Griffin sniffed the air and turned away from the carnage. I want you out of here now. I don't want anyone to see you near this place. Go out the way you came. Ilsa will be there. Ilsa's getting on my nerves. Get out of here, Rico. Do it now. Rico shrugged and disappeared behind the marble slab. Griffin walked quickly toward the doorway to the hall. The big wooden doorway exploded and sank to the ground. Griffin stepped back. Dread stalked into the room, the shotgun smoking in his hand. He looked at Griffin, then passed him at the horror of the council table. He raised his eyes slowly, aimed the Remington squarely at Griffin's head. You murdering bastard, you. Dread stopped, shook his head. Rico, he did this. You wouldn't have the stomach for it, would you? Where is he? Where is he, Griffin? Don't be foolish, Griffin said. Rico is dead. And he's been dead for years. Talk to me. Where is he? Dread, listen to me, all right? Griffin raised his hands and backed away. Things are going to change, whether you like it or not. Nothing's going to stop this. Not you, not anyone. Janice, is that what you're talking about? Dredd turned his thumb straight down. I won't let it happen. I will stop you any way I can. There's nothing you can do. Not now. Nothing that... A shout echoed through the corridor. Heavy boots pounded the granite floor. Dredd jerked around and faced Griffin. Griffin smiled, grabbed his belly, doubled up and writhed on the floor. In here! He yelled. Hurry, for God's sake! Dredd stared at the man, then suddenly understood. He cursed Griffin under his breath and ran, dodging into the small anteroom off the council chamber. Half a second later, Judge Hunter swarmed into the room, lawgivers at the ready. Get him! Griffin pointed shakily from the floor. Damn it! Go! He murdered the whole council! The Hunter squad turned and charged out of the room. An officer bent down over Griffin. Griffin recognized the face. We'll take care of you, sir. I got medics on the way. Rick, Captain, never mind that. Get Dredd. Kill him! The officer hurried away. Griffin waited until the footsteps echoed down the hall. He then stood and walked to the black table. He looked into Magruder's dead eyes. He touched her with his finger, then drew a red smear across his chest. Word would get out that he was wounded. 
that he wouldn't even let the hunter stop to give him medical care. He smiled at that thought. He could picture them at dinner in their barracks. It was pleasant to imagine the things they might say. There is nothing to keep us from going to fully operational status, Griffin said. There is no longer any council, and the city is in chaos. There is only one authority left that any government personnel will listen to. Me. Rico raised a brow. What you didn't do was kill Dredd when you had the chance. That was not a good decision, Mr. Chief Justice. He'll keep the street judges occupied while we work on Janus, Griffin said. It's not a problem, my friend. I do hope not. I don't like problems. I like things to flow. Isn't that so, Ilsa? Rico likes things to flow. Ilsa laughed. Griffin thought her features had an almost alien beauty. It seemed inconceivable that such perfection stood so close to Rico's giant robot, that relic of forgotten wars. Yet she was a cold perfection, much like the silver monster itself. Maybe they belonged together, along with Rico, who was perfection of a sort himself. I'll be back, Griffin said. You don't need me for routine initiation. Central, prepare the Janus facility for full operations. My command. Janus operational. One more thing. Rico stepped into his path. I believed you promised. What? Griffin paused. Oh, yes, of course. A central, appoint Judge Rico to the Council of Judges. Appointment to take effect at once, Central replied. Unable to comply. Why not? Legal difficulties. Judge Rico is listed as officially executed nine years. Well, your listing is obviously an error. Central does not make errors. <clears throat> Correction of records, Central. Authority is Chief Justice Griffin. Central is not mistaken. You were given incorrect data. Judge Rico is alive. Please correct and carry out my command. Data corrected. Judge Rico is alive. Judge Rico is approved as a council member as of this date. Entered. Thank you, Rico bowed. I accept and I will carry out my duties to the best of my ability. Griffin turned on his heels and stalked across the room. Ilsa walked up beside Rico. He could hear the soft fabric of her dress against her legs. She laid a hand gently on his arm. You shouldn't anger him like that. Ilsa walked up beside Rico. He could hear the soft fabric of her dress against her legs. She laid a hand gently on his arm. You shouldn't anger him like that. I like to. You don't have to, Rico. She tried to pull away. His fingers pressed into the soft flesh of her arm. You don't want to say things like that, Ilsa. Griffin thinks I'm insensitive. He's wrong. I have feelings. Don't I, Fido? The big robot made a rumbling noise. You and I should not be in conflict, Ilsa. No, we should not. Well, then we won't be, will we? Rico smiled. We will work as a close, smoothly running team. He turned and walked to the computer bank gazed at the thousand blinking eyes. Status of the Janus Project, Central. The DNA samples have been removed from frozen state. Operation is online. I am prepared to begin the cloning procedure upon command. Put that on hold, Central. Slight change of plans. I wish to purge the DNA samples you have on hand. Ilsa stepped forward. 
What are you doing, Rico? What is this? Rico didn't answer. Proceed, Central. DNA samples purged. Central, activate the DNA sampling console. Sampling console activated and ready. Ilsa clenched her fist at her side. The robot warrior word swiveled its head an inch to the right. My God, it knows. It can sense my emotions, heartbeat, something. She watched as Rico walked to the dark metal wall. A panel opened with no sound at all. A white ceramic shelf appeared. Rico ripped his sleeve away and placed his bare arm on the hollow. A shiny tube whined out of the wall, split itself into eight gleaming needles, clawed for an instant in the air, then plunged its silver fingers into Rico's arm. Narrow columns of red began to climb the spidery points. The red disappeared. The needles rose quickly and sucked themselves into the wall. Rico smiled at the eight crimson droplets on his arm. DNA samples have been obtained. Analysis and replication proceeding. Rico laughed. Griffin is a, a plumber, a file clerk. All he's doing is exploiting my genius, my intelligence and abilities. And yours, Ilsa. We're the giants here. Griffin is the dwarf. Don't you see that? Ilsa closed her eyes. My God. It was a mistake to keep you alive. He should have never done it this way. Rico poked a finger between her breasts, hard enough to make her gasp. He touched her lips. Ilsa held her breath, stunned by the power, the force, the raw heat that seemed to draw them together. When he finally drew her to him, his presence overwhelmed her, took her in a rush. He bared his arm again, showed her the red spots of his blood where the silver spider had drunk its fill. He didn't have to ask her, to tell her. She knew what to do, what she ached to do, though she had never known this need before. You are an extraordinary woman, Elsa. This is a moment only you and I could share. No one else. Because there are no others like us in the world. She brought his arm to her face, let the droplets brush her cheek, brought her lips to each small well of red. Yes, she heard herself say. Yes. 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 He stood in the narrow hallway, clutching the Remington. Stay behind me, he told Fergie. I don't want you in the way. Hey, no problem, Fergie said. Won't even know I'm here. The room was totally wrecked. Hershey's computer had been dashed against the wall. Dark scars on the wall said someone had picked up the machine and tossed it half a dozen times. He left the living area and moved quickly down the hall. More broken glass. Blue shreds of paper that looked familiar to Dredd. He picked up a piece, held it to the light. Came from a judge training manual. Civil Disorder 201. This is not what we ought to be doing, Dredd. This is where the hunters are going to expect you to be. Let's get low, man. Old Fergie will take you downtown where I, I know how to survive. Sewer rats. Uh, pardon me? You want me to hide with sewer rats? The lawbreakers? The scum? Oh, excuse me, Fergie raised his hands. I mean, just because every judge hunter in Mega City wants your ass nailed up on the wall doesn't mean I shouldn't show proper respect at all times. Dredd stepped into the bedroom. The boot hit him hard in the chest. Hershey held the lawgiver steady in both hands, the muzzle aimed between his eyes. Both of you, up against the wall, spread them wide. Hershey, I thought they'd... Thought they'd what? Killed me? You thought so, or hoped, Dredd. Hold on a minute. Stop it. What happened here? I'm a judge. Someone wants to kill me. Someone almost did. They, they get you in the street, in your home, anywhere. She gave Dredd a chilling look. Why don't you tell me what's happening? They are dying out there. 108 judges in 48 hours. What the hell is going on? Dredd shook his head. You think I'm part of this? I don't know who or, or what you are anymore. I don't know anything. 
I would never hurt you, Hershey. Hershey backed off across the room. She reached in her jacket and tossed a viewie to Dredd. Tell me about this. Make me believe in you again, the way I did when I defended you. I couldn't imagine you doing anything that was against the law. And then I found this. Dredd took the viewie without looking at it. The man beside me in this picture is my brother. His name is Rico. He was the best judge on the street, the smartest, most dedicated. And suddenly something happened to him, to his mind. He went insane, Hershey. He said the judges should rule, not serve. He said that was our destiny in life, our place in history. He finally became more dangerous than any of the criminals he'd put away. A lot of men died trying to stop him. I had to judge him. That was the one, Hershey said. Yeah, that was the one. And you're telling me he's doing all this? All this killing? Not by himself. He's working for Griffin. Griffin? Hershey slowly lowered her weapon. Oh, my God. It fits, doesn't it? We've got to let the council know. They've, they've got to stop him before he... It's too late for that. There isn't any council. Rico murdered them all an hour ago. Griffin set it up. Griffin was there. Hershey sat down. All I could think about was the tribunal. I should have known when I found out you'd been drugged. I, I thought it was Fargo that he didn't want you to try to stop him from taking the long walk for you. You didn't even know that, did you? What they'd done. Oh, Dredd. It's all right, he told her. You didn't have any way to know what that son of a bitch was doing. No one did. That's why the DNA convicted you. You and Rico are the same. Brothers. Did Fargo know? Was he... He was part of it. They all knew. Everyone on the council. It's not exactly like Rico and I are like real brothers. We're the same. Clones. We're inhuman. Defective. He just broke down first. Oh, no, Dredd. You are not the same. You said it, Hershey. Remember? That I had no feelings, no emotions? Well, now you know why. I'm not programmed to feel. Just like Rico. They didn't do that to you, she said. You did that to yourself. You hurt because you had to condemn your brother. You told yourself you would never let that happen to you again. You would never take care for anyone, never let anyone close. He felt confused, mixed up inside. It was like she was talking about someone else, someone like him. Fergie poked his head in the door. The uh, computer's back up to the idiot stage, and that's the best I can do for it right now. I got enough of it working to go in and look around. I tried to find this Janice business, but there's nothing. Nowhere. Hershey looked puzzled. Janice? That's the code word for the project that brought Rico and me to life. I'm not surprised Ferguson can't find it. It would be buried under so many security barriers. Dread stopped. If Griffin's got Janice back online now, it's going to be using a lot of power. Fergie shook his head. I tried that. No new energy allocations for anything that big, even under an alias. Of course, that moron machine I patched together, I wouldn't trust it to count apples. No, they wouldn't risk putting something like that on the net, would they? Hershey said. But it's still got to use power, so they'd... Hmm, they'd have to steal it, wouldn't they? From everything they could get their hands on. Check the sectors for recent blackouts, any sudden power surges. Can you do that? Fergie looked pained. I can handle anything you dream up, Judge. But this mortally wounded machine of yours, I don't know. I can try. Wait a minute. Hershey bit her lip. The day of that fracas in Red Quad, I had to write up everything that happened because those groons blew up my lawmaster. I called up all the data in that area within the time parameters, temperature, bioair samples, even pollen count, for God's sake. I remember there was a significant power surge about 30 blocks wide. A big one. It didn't mean a thing to me at the time. Fergie whistled under his breath. 
Something like that shut down the power grid and the whole sector. We ought to be able to pin down a lot more than you get on the first level data report. What do you mean? Dredd said. Well, it doesn't just burn up everything in your body it touches. It leaves a trail. Nerve endings all crudded up, stuff like that. If you didn't know where the trouble started, you could pick up the trail about anywhere and trace it right back to the point of origin. Fergie tapped the keys, frowned, and looked at the screen. Let's hope this thing's still got the brain cells to... Yes! All right! Well, that's your basic power record for the date in question. Everywhere close to the red quad. Those uh, little peaks are minor overloads. Now this one, the Big Daddy, is the power surge you're talking about, Judge. That's coming up now. Okay, okay, couple of seconds. Okay, we're home. Block war day. Fergie nodded at the screen. Intricate capillaries of energy webbed the sector, merging at one central point, a glowing amber ball. That's underground, Dredd said. No big surprise. Way underground, Fergie added. Nothing goes that deep, man. Nothing I ever heard of. Wait. What's that? That thing right there. Oh, that's after image, Fergie said. I could clean it up if everything was working right. No. No, you couldn't, Hershey said. It's there, where it's supposed to be. You see that profile? That's the Liberty Lady. And what's left of her? The city relocated it, what, 75 years ago? Fergie slapped a fist into his palm. I've seen her. They built one of those death traps across from Heavenly Haven. Built it right around that lady of yours. Swallowed it up again. Hershey looked at Dredd. They built the Janus Project directly beneath it. Underneath the Liberty Lady. Yeah, Dredd said. Where else? Griffin could almost feel the energy, the awesome surge of raw power that throbbed beneath his feet. That much power... It was frightening to imagine. New life, the pulse of creation itself. Ilsa and Rico turned as he entered. The big robot stood silently behind Rico. Dredd got away from the hunters, Griffin told them. Took some good men with him, too. Bastards got nine lives. Not to worry, Rico said. Little brother won't get in our way. Rico made a note on a comm board and passed it to Ilsa. He's going to be seriously outnumbered quite soon. Current figures, please, Central. Current figures, Council Judge Rico. The new DNA sample has been multiplexed as ordered. Gametes are dividing. New? Griffin turned on Rico. New samples? What the hell's going on here, Rico? I didn't order any new samples. No, but I did. That DNA in there was 30 years old. Sooner or later, you have to clean out the fridge. Ilsa laughed. Griffin watched as she leaned in against him, watched her slide her hand down the length of his arm. He knew at once, knew what had happened between them. It had all gone wrong. It was Rico who had seduced the woman, not the other way around. Not the way he'd planned. You dare do something like that. That sample was created with the greatest of care for the... Griffin stopped. W what did you replace it with, Rico? Ilsa buried her laughter in Rico's sleeve. Oh, my God. No, you didn't. Please. Rico looked hurt. You should be congratulating me, Chief Justice. I'm going to be a father. You don't know what you are doing, Griffin told him. The sample has to be pure of defects, or the accelerator will form mutations. That's what's happened before. Rico laughed aloud. That's why Dread's so ugly. No, Griffin stepped into his path, his fist clenched at his side. It's you. For God's sake, Rico, you were defective. Your copies will be even more defective. Rico's eyes blazed. You're lying, Griffin. All you are is about control. Your control. But the Janus judges won't be the puppets you want. They'll be my brothers. Who do you think they're going to listen to? 
You or me? Griffin closed his eyes a moment. Ilsa, you're with him on this? You can't be. You know better. You know what he is. I don't think you understand the full potential of this opportunity, honey. She let her fingers rest on Rico's chest. This project needs vision, not politics. No, this cannot happen. Griffin shook his head. It can't. I'm afraid there's not much you can do about it, Chief Justice. Griffin whipped a small pistol from his tunic. No, not again, he said. No more like you. The robot's arm came out of nowhere, wrapped a flexible steel tendril around Griffin's arm. The weapon clattered to the floor. Get it off of me, Rico! Get it off! The robot lifted him off the floor. Rico, for God's sake, please! Rico shook his head. You never understood me, did you, Griffin? I'm alive. I'm real. I'm not something you made to carry out the trash. Central, override. Griffin strained against the robot's grip. Help me. Request is denied, Chief Justice. The ABC War Robot is not linked to my main processor. You need to keep up with the times, Rico said. You look away for just a tiny second. Technology passes you by. He watched the man dangling helplessly above. Looked at his eyes, at the terror in his face. He felt a sense of completion, a great sense of peace. Fido, here, boy. Yeah, tear off Chief Justice Griffin's arms and legs, please, and save the head for last. They left the lawmasters behind a wall half a block away. Dredd wasn't sure what kind of sensors Griffin might have above ground, but he saw no reason to take any chances now. He held a scanner in his hand, watching the line of green static dance across the tiny screen. Dead ahead, Hershey said. Right? Down there. Dredd thumbed shells into the Remington. Well, looks like you guys have got everything under control, Fergie said. Now I'll watch the lawmasters. Nobody's going to get past me. I might need you down there, Dredd said, to help shut down the Janus system. <laughs> you know, I knew you were going to say that. I knew it. Dredd looked up. He could see the broken profile of the Liberty Lady's face embedded on the ancient brick wall. One sad and empty eye, part of a cheek, a piece of a heavy brow. Higher in the wall, the suggestion of a hand, a rusted torch. Dredd looked away, studied the scanner. And let his group inside. The building had been closed for repairs many years ago, then forgotten. Dread walked through the empty hallways. A concrete stairway led to a cellar below. Ahead was a concrete wall. The scanner says the source of the power surge is straight ahead. He nodded at the solid wall. Right there. My lawgiver might blast through it, Hershey said, but I doubt it. Fergie let out a breath. People, just move aside, will you? He shook his head at Dread. I'll bet you locked yourself in the bathroom when you were a kid, right? Fergie pressed his palms against the wall in a dozen places. See, it's an old-fashioned pressure lock. Fifty, sixty years ago, the Hushador. Big rage back then. Known in the trade as the burglar's delight. Nobody's been dumb enough to use one since. Fergie pressed three fingers against the wall. Nothing. Moved a foot to the right. The third time, he moved down a foot and a half, pressed against the cold concrete. A seam appeared, the width of a door. Fergie gave it a gentle shove. The slab of concrete hissed aside. Very impressive, Hershey said. Not bad, said Dread. Thanks, Fergie said. I'm underwhelmed by your support. The door slid shut behind him. Oh, and if anyone's interested, that thing hasn't been used in a hell of a long time. And who's ever coming in and out of this Janus deal has another way than this. Good, Dredd said. Maybe they won't expect us. <laughs> Drink to that as soon as we find a bar. Scanner, said Hershey. That way, said Dredd. The passage went another hundred yards, twisting in every direction. 
Dredd noticed the absence of rats. He didn't need the scanner now. He could feel the deep tremor of power. The rats didn't like that at all. Air, Fergie sniffed. Fresher than where we've been. Processed air. Dredd nodded. The corridor took a sharp turn to the left. Douse the light, he said. He moved past the corner. Hershey followed. We're close, she said softly. I can feel the electricity in my hair. We'd better... Dread! A blur of metal whipped around Hershey's waist, jerked her off her feet. The lawgiver fell from her hands. Dread brought his Remington up to fire. The robot was faster. An automatic weapon chattered in its free hand, stitching a deadly path. Fergie stood frozen, staring wide-eyed at the monster overhead. Down! Dread yelled. He was a millisecond late. Fergie cried out, grabbed his chest, spun around twice, and slammed into the concrete wall. Dredd bent low and stalked toward the big robot, blasting with the Remington, racking one shell into the chamber after the next. Knowing he wasn't even denting the metal warrior's hide, that he didn't dare fire at the brute's face or its steel and copper gut. He might put a hole in the son of a bitch's vital parts, but he might hit Hershey instead. A bullet plowed a shallow furrow through the flesh of Dredd's upper arm. The pain rocked him on his heels. Hershey screamed, kicking out against the robot's grip. The robot fired a volley at Dredd. Dredd felt flecks of stone slice his cheek. He rolled, came to his feet, held the Remington at his waist, and blasted at the narrow slit in the robot's metal joint. A blue electric flash, a wisp of black smoke. Dredd fired again, saw the bright sizzle, heard the high-pitched whine as steel tendons snapped. The robot shuddered. His brain said, forward mode. One foot made it off the ground. The other didn't budge. The robot teetered, then hit the floor like a quake. Forward mode was still intact. The robot pounded its good foot against the ground. A jackhammer gone berserk. Hershey was still in the robot's grip. Dredd ran to her. He heard the sigh of air, turned, saw the door slide open behind him. Rico. Rico and a woman. Both held weapons in their hands. He recognized the woman at once. Ilsa Hayden from Rico's trial. What was she doing here? That'll be enough, Rico said. Just put the weapon down. No way. I shot this thing. I'm going to eat it. That's amusing, I'm sure. Rico turned to the robot. Fido, you clumsy bastard. You don't mind functioning a while. Break Judge Hershey's neck, please, on the count of three. One, two. Hershey, you all right? I'm, um, yeah, I'm all right, Dredd. Dredd let the Remington fall from his hand. Rico laughed. How human of you. Become a romantic brother? He motioned with his weapon. Inside now. Fido, if the lady moves, crush her. Ilsa walked past Dredd. When she bent to pick up Dredd's shotgun, she looked directly into Fergie's eyes. Nice. Bit crude, but, uh, nice. Watch her, Rico said. She's a real tease, Dredd. Where's your boss, Dredd said. Let you out of your cage for the day? Rico shook his finger at Dredd. If you're trying to get on my good side... Won't do you any good, because I don't have one. Where's Griffin? Chief Justice Griffin is retired, so to speak. In his absence, I've assumed his responsibilities. You mean you killed him? Rico looked pained. Me? Of course not. He had an accident with Fido. Doggy's not entirely housebroken, I'm afraid. Ilsa raised her weapon, closed one eye, and let the muzzle drop to the level of Dredd's chest. Rico told you to move, honey. I think you should do what he says. Dredd didn't answer. He walked toward the door where Rico and Ilsa had entered. He looks like you, Ilsa said. He is a lot like me, naturally. I'm nothing like you, Dredd said. Rico turned on him. Wrong, brother. The only difference between us is that you destroyed your life to embrace the law. I destroyed the law to embrace life. He swept out his palm, bowing slightly to Dredd. After you, please, step into the future, brother. 
This is how tomorrow looks. This is the way Rico's world is going to be. Dredd stepped inside. Half a million razor points of light burned in the darkness overhead. Dredd drew in a breath. A hundred columns of luminescent brightness rose up from the floor. Glittering capsules, pods of azure blue, shimmering tubes of life. They stood erect in the clear blue fluid. Clones. Mutants. Beings unborn and already alive. Dredd stared at a watery face. Sharp planes. Rigid neck. Dark hair drifting like seaweed above his head. It opened its silver eyes and looked back. Rico laughed. <laughs> this is the nursery, brother. Don't you recognize it? This is where you were born. Now don't look at him with such distaste, Joseph. That isn't just me in there. It's you. Dredd felt the agony, the pain, and knew it wouldn't go away. Rico had guessed his thought, seen the revulsion, the horror there, and Dredd knew he was right. It was true. Looking at the clone was like looking in a mirror at himself. Rico walked away from Dredd, turned, the shimmering pods at his back. Look at him, Joseph. Your brothers. In a few hours they'll be born. An endless supply of perfection. Now we have a choice. To create a race of robots like Fido out there, or a race of free-thinking people, and call them humans. Why did you do it, Joseph? I thought about it all these years. Why? Why did you judge me? I didn't have a choice. You killed innocent people. Only as a means to an end, brother. You're forgetting that. That's a lie you tell yourself. It was massacre. Murder. You can't call it anything else. You betrayed the law. Rico laughed. <laughs> I was your blood. Your brother. The only family you ever had. You sent me to my death and you talked to me about betrayal? You are the traitor, brother, not me. Do you want to be the slave all your life? Do what you're told to do, Joseph? You have a choice now. Them or me. You haven't given me a choice. I have to stop you, Rico. If you want to stop me, you'll have to kill me. Rico looks sad. Well... I can certainly accommodate you, brother. But there's no hurry, is there? Fido. Rico looked past Dredd through the great door of the Janus lab. Bring Judge Hershey in here, then tear the bitch's arms and legs off. Dredd didn't move. Don't do it, Rico. Or you'll what, Joseph? Arrest me? Rico's eyes blazed. Take this one too, Fido. Crush them. Let's make some judge soup. Rico... Ilsa stepped toward him. Stay away from me. Do as I say, Ilsa. Rico's voice scared the hell out of Ilsa. The giant robot clanged through the doorway, scraping its metal hide. It dragged its bad foot. One red eye looked off a good twenty degrees. Dredd saw Hershey in its grip. He tried to read her eyes. Something. Not the way it ought to be. Take him, Rico said. Do it now. The robot stopped. Word. Its blunt head swiveled on its hydraulic neck. A heavy foot stomped against the floor. It turned, then dropped Hershey from its grasp, raised its hand, and slammed Rico in the chest. Rico cried out in surprise, staggered back and fell. Ilsa ran to him. The robot moved in a blur, plucked her off the floor and threw her to the ground. The robot turned on one heel. Fergie was hanging on the monster's metal back, his hands buried in an open slot. Dredd caught a glimpse of the controls, Blinking lights, tangled coils of wire. Dread, over here! Hershey tossed him the Remington. Dread racked a shell in the chamber, turned and fired at Rico. Rico darted for cover, grabbed his lawgiver and squeezed off half a dozen shots at Dread on the run. Then he disappeared into a maze of blue pods. Dread saw the robot lurch, then run headlong into a solid wall. Fergie, what the hell are you doing? I'm not doing anything. Fergie cried out. This damn thing wants to drive by itself. The robot staggered, beat on the wall with its head. It stumbled, clattered dizzily across the room, reached up to slap the tormentor off its back. No way, you, you tin-headed freak. Fergie thrust his whole arm into the robot's back, jerked out a tangle of flashing wires. The robot went berserk. Its head turned completely around. Blue fire sparked from its eyes and ears. Bashed itself against the wall, ripping Fergie loose. 
The robot took two jerky steps and toppled on its face. Smoke billowed from its chest. Watch it, Dread, Hershey called. The woman's off to the right, by the wall somewhere, and Rico's back there. Dredd saw her and bent low near the tall accelerator. She nodded toward the forest of blue fluorescent pods. Hiding with your brothers, yours, not mine. Dredd kept low. Fergie was on his back. You okay, Ferguson? I'm, I, I don't think I'm too good. Dredd looked at his face, at the blood soaking the front of his shirt. Ferguson was right. He wasn't too good at all. You, you never got to say it, Dredd. Never got to say what? Hey, you know, man. Yeah, I do. Dredd drew in a breath. I... I made a mistake. I'm sorry I misjudged you, Ferguson. A and you'll never arrest me again? Oh. Okay, I'll never arrest you again. Fergie grinned. Okay, man. He closed his eyes. Dredd grabbed his shoulders. Ferguson. Ferguson, you talk to me, damn you. Dredd let him go. He clenched his fists, felt the fury begin deep in his belly, felt the fire race through his veins. Rico! He screamed out the name, grabbed the Remington, and ran toward the blue pods. Come out of there! Come out of there, Rico! He was driven by a rage he could scarcely contain, an anger that blinded him to caution and reason, a hatred that could only focus on Rico's face, Rico's laughter, Rico's silver eyes. He stalked through the eerie blue light, through the maze of glowing pods. Rico's spawn surrounded him, a company of ghosts, their coral lips open, their flesh unearthly white. Rico! Dredd squeezed off two shots. A crystal pod shattered. The clone blew apart in a blossom of pink and white. Rico, I'm coming for you. I'm coming! The hail of gunfire came at him from the dark. Dredd turned, went to his knees, firing back in a wicked arc. Incubator shattered, spilling slippery flesh on the floor. One of Dredd's shots hit a tall accelerator, a black and silver column at the heart of the Janus lab. Lightning crackled along the tower, snaked to the top, then exploded in a blinding fireball, showering the pods with comets of molten steel. The incubators cracked. A flood of thick, amniotic fluid hissed in the terrible heat. Dredd saw him then, as the computer burst into flame. Rico ran. Dread fired, blowing a hole into the console, blinding a thousand red eyes. The fire would keep Rico busy. A minute, minute and a half. Dread broke into the open, keeping low, heading straight for Rico's hiding place. Rico caught him there, raised up and raked his path with automatic fire. Dread cursed and scrambled for cover, lead tearing the heel off his boot. Where the hell was Hershey? She had gone after Ilsa hours, no, only minutes ago. Time was playing tricks again. Another incubator exploded. Blue fire webbed the walls, sizzled the concrete floor. Dredd saw the flames beginning to burst from the equipment on the far side of the lab. Getting hot in here. Gonna get a hell of a lot worse. Rico laughed, a high-pitched grating sound that set Dredd's nerves on edge. Central, that's the first set of clones, Rico shouted. On my command, now. Rico, don't do that. The cloning process is not finished, Chief Justice Rico. The clones will be only 63% complete. I don't care if they're pretty or not. I want the damn clones now! Something exploded down below with the roar of a blast furnace, spewing a ball of yellow fire up through the floor. Place was going up. It couldn't last long. Hershey, where the hell are you? Hershey knew the woman was there, somewhere in this maze of piping, of bundled strands of cable and wire in the maintenance area in the back of the lab. Rico and Dredd were ripping the Janus lab apart. She could already feel the heat, see the flames licking at the pods. When the firestorm got back here, with umpteen zillion volts of power droning above her head, that combination, and pipes full of oxygen, nitrogen, and God knows what. Ilsa moved. Hershey heard her, came to her feet, and threw herself into the dark. Ilsa cried out, twisted herself, and swung a heavy wrench at Hershey's head. Hershey winced as the wrench caught her shoulder. Judge, bitch. Keep away from me. I wouldn't get near you on a bet, Hershey told her. But duty calls, friend. Hershey fainted to the left, balled her fist, and hit Ilsa solidly in the belly. Ilsa gasped, stumbled, reached out and caught herself. 
She kicked out hard, a vicious blow with plenty of power behind it. Hershey felt something break, turned on her heels and saw the incubator coming. Crystal shatters raining on her back in a rush of bilious fluid. The thing flopped out, slick as a fish, its head lying inches from Hershey's. Hershey felt the hairs creep up the back of her neck. The thing made a strangled noise in its throat, tried to pull itself erect on boneless flipper arms. It came at Hershey in its wet, bare muscle, pulsing veins clinging to bare bone. A bubble came out of its mouth. It sighed once, dropped with a sickening sound. Hershey got to her feet. Ilsa was gone. Black smoke was creeping across the floor. Hershey was sure she couldn't go back the way she'd come, and there was nothing but dead and smelly mutants up ahead. The flames licked at the heart of the pods. The smoke was too thick. He couldn't see Rico at all. The forest of incubators had turned into the center of hell. Fire shattered the crystal tubes. Mutants writhed and twisted in pain, caught in a terrible moment of horror between birth and fiery death. Dread turned away. The image was etched forever in his mind. The manual made it clear. Daydreaming is spelled D-E-A-D. -E Dead. Rico hit him with a broken steel bar. The blow caught him just below the knee. Dread went down. Rico raised his weapon for the final killing blow. Dread rolled, grabbed Rico and held on. Rico grunted, tore his way free and pounded Dread in the face. Dread felt his mouth fill with blood. Dread kicked him in the crotch. Rico pushed Dread away, backed off. Dread was sure Rico had fractured his leg. He watched Rico scramble along the floor, grab his lawgiver. Shit, Dread said. Rico laughed, gave the weapon a loud command. Grenade! All lethal rounds exhausted. Select. Standard fire! All lethal rounds exhausted. Select. Smoke bomb, damn you! Dredd saw the muzzle flash, saw the round coming at him in a blur. It sizzled, then blossomed into a ball of liquid fire. Rico howled. Central, turn off the overhead lighting, now! The room went dark. Flames lit the curved walls of the room. Dredd struggled to his feet, fighting the heat that tried to gnaw through his chest. He turned on his back, gagged on the oily black smoke. Central, he yelled. Turn on the damn lights. Request denied. You are an escaped convict, Joseph Dredd. Surrender to authorities at once. Dredd swore, tore at his armor, finally ripped it free and tossed it across the room. Another pot exploded, sending mutant parts high into the air. Something fell close by. It had a half-sized head. The head looked just like dread. Central. Central. Look, I'll give myself up, okay? I'll surrender to Chief Justice Rico. Locate. Please. Chief Justice Rico has entered lift 990 through the A door to your right. Lift. What lift? It had to be the other way in. The real way to the Janus lab. The A door took him down a long and narrow corridor. It finally came to an end in a metal door, a glowing arrow pointing up. Dredd punched the button. The door slid back, shut again quickly, locking him in. The door slid open again. Dredd sucked in fresh air. Rain beat down upon his head. Soot ran down and stung his eyes. Rico stood just beyond him. His face was red with blood. Waiting for you, brother. Thought you'd never come. I'm here, Dredd said. Rico shook his head. He aimed the lawgiver at Dredd's chest. Thunder rolled through the blackened skies. Dredd guessed they were fifty, sixty stories high. The roof of Heavenly Haven, above the streets of Red Quad, where it had all begun. This is how you repay me, brother, for telling you the truth? How can you go against me, Joseph? I'm the only person in the world in your life who never lied to you. You broke the law. I did what I had to do. Oh no, brother. Rico's terrible grin twisted his features. No, we won't go through that business again. You will not limp away telling me about the law. Rico closed his eyes, opened them again. Rain pelted off his face. He raised the lawgiver, let its muzzle rest on Dredd's head. 
Joseph Dredd, do you stand ready to answer for your crimes? Get on with it, Rico. Dredd? Rico shook his weapon in Dredd's face. I hereby judge you, Dredd, to the charge of betraying your best friend? Guilty! To the charge of betraying your own flesh? Guilty! And finally, to the charge of being human when we could have been gods! Guilty! Rico's eyes went wide. The sentence is death! Rico squeezed the trigger. Click. All lethal rounds exhausted. Select. No! Dredd let out a breath. Rico had forgotten. The madness had overwhelmed him, clouded his reason. Damn you! Fire! Rico's hand shook. He stared at the lawgiver as if the weapon, too, had betrayed him. All lethal rounds exhausted. Select. Fire! Fire! Dredd moved. His right hand struck out a short sweep to Rico's jaw. He forced the fingers of his left hand over the weapon's grip, clamping down on Rico's hand. Rico looked at him. Joseph! DNA accepted, the gun voice word. Select. Signal flare, said Dredd. Dredd fought against Rico's grip, wrenched the weapon up, away from them both. The night turned red. The flare singed Rico's face and rocketed into the night. Rico cried out, stumbling blindly away from Dredd. One foot found the edge of the roof, the other stepped into empty space. Rico flailed his arms, fell away. Dredd lunged for him, caught him by the wrist. Rico hung there, blinked up at Dredd with blind eyes. You saved me, Joseph. Why did you do that? The rain whipped down in a fury, the cold drops hard as stones. I'll get you out of here. Hang on. You don't have to die, Rico. Rico smiled. All right, Joseph. I won't. He brought his free hand up quickly, grabbed Dredd's wrist, and forced his hand free. Life sentence, Joseph. Works fine for me. Rico slid free. No! Dredd watched him turn slowly. His arms spread wide, watched him grow smaller, disappear in the dark veil of rain. His face was still there. His face. My face. He knew he was alone once more. Hollow. Nothing inside. Rico had taken it all away once. Now he had taken it again. Dredd was aware of the presence. The feeling of another person near. He looked up. Saw Ilsa Hayden. The rain-soaked dress clinging to her slender form. The dark hair plastered against her cheeks. She held the Remington an inch from his head, showed him a gentle smile, drew her lips together, let them apart like a lover's tender kiss. Ilse's head disappeared. A red mist hung in the air for a moment and then swept away in the driving rain. Ilse's body folded, slid to the edge of the roof, and followed Rico down. Dread turned. Hershey stood in the lift, a lawgiver clutched in her hand. Behind her, Fergie sagged against the wall. His face was pale. Dredd looked at Hershey. He shook his head at Fergie. You're alive, Dredd said simply. What did you think I'd do? Die or something? Right when you and me were just getting to be good friends? We are not friends, Ferguson. We know each other. We... Okay, we're acquaintances. I'll go as far as that. Right. Close enough. Uh, how about that other stuff? I said it once. Don't ask me again. Honestly, Dredd, Hershey said. All right. I'm dropping all charges. Do whatever you want. You're free. Fergie laughed. Laughing hurt, but what the hell? <laughs> I knew that, he said. What are friends for? They were waiting in the street. Hundreds of them. Street judges, cadets, judge hunters. The street was jammed with lawmasters, blue, white, and green lights flashing into the night. The storm had moved off to the south. Dredd walked out of the doorway and into the street. Hershey stood beside him. Fergie held up between them. Medics hurried over, easing him gently to a stretcher. 
An okay smile, Dredd thought. The guy was maybe all right, maybe just that he caught himself, tried to think about anything else. The two judge hunters walked toward him, stiff, proud, their faces devoid of any emotion at all. Dredd drew in a breath. Easy, Hershey said. The two hunters parted. A third man stepped between them. He was taller than the other two, a dark-haired man in his forties. Dredd recognized him at once. He wore the white braid of Chief Judge Hunter across his chest. The man stopped in front of Dredd. I'm Judge Lackard, he nodded curtly at Hershey. You're Joseph Dredd. Yes, sir. Am I under arrest or what? Lackard looked at him a long moment. That won't be necessary. We, Central has broadcast the Janus plans in the clear. After Griffin's death, everyone knows what happened in there. We, uh... Owe you a debt of gratitude, Judge Dredd. Not Joseph Dredd this time. Judge Dredd. Dredd looked out at the crowd, the men and women he respected, the law, the only life he knew. We have to reorganize the council, Blackard said. We'd like you to consider the position of Chief Justice. Thank you. I'm honored. Dredd nodded to his right. I recommend Judge Hershey, sir. The judge hunter nodded. Would you consider it, Judge Hershey? Hershey looked astonished. I... are you sure? Don't be dumb, Hershey, Dredd said. It's a good career move. Uh, let me think about it, sir, Hershey said. Dredd looked pained. Don't think, Hershey. Do it. Haven't I taught you anything? Dredd turned and walked away. He spotted a lawmaster standing ready and headed for it. Hershey followed him, stepped in his path. So that's it, huh? A near-death experience and no goodbye? Hershey. What? Goodbye. Hershey grinned. You are hopeless, Dredd. Totally hopeless. She touched the back of his neck, drew him close and kissed him full on the mouth before he could pull away. That's a code 212, Dredd said. Illegal physical contact with a judge. No, that's a 137. You impersonating a groon, Dredd. You're human. You don't have to fake it, friend. Dredd threw his leg over the saddle of the lawmaster. He looked at Hershey and grinned. <laughs> Typical behavior, Hershey. I knew you'd say that. Yeah? You think you know everything, Dredd. You don't. There's a hell of a lot of stuff you don't know. Dredd thought about it. Decided maybe she was right. He gripped the control bar of the lawmaster. Let the engine whine up to a roar. A thunder of raw power that trembled off the walls of Red Quad and drowned every sound in Dredd's world. In Judge Hershey's second year as Chief Justice, the Lady Liberty, or Statue of Liberty as it was known in the way back when, was ordered completely restored and placed in a prominent position in the plaza across from the Hall of Justice. While the council felt the statue did not entirely reflect Megacity's current standards of justice, it was the majority opinion, under the leadership of Chief Justice Hershey, that the presence of the Lady Liberty underscored the need for reforms in several areas of criminal and civil law. History of the Mega Cities, James Olmeyer III, Chapter 41, The Hershey Years, 2191.